C, line segment A, B. Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Oh my, God. Yeah. my name is Tim. I'll be moderating until the uh, question period when Brown will be taking over. Tonight we're going to be talking about molten salt nucle thorium nuclear reactors. Is it the solution to our energy needs or is it just another nuclear debacle? We are, we are still waiting for Dennis Nelson for the opposition to show up, but if he doesn't, I'll do my best to represent that side of the debate. The format of the debate is going to be as follows. There'll be two 10-minute sessions, uh, two 10-minute sessions each, and then there'll be a five-minute uh, wrap-up along with uh, questions after that and then, a and then a rebuttal period. But before that, in keeping it Again, because Dennis is not here, I'm going to have uh, Andy Anderson step in for the anti-nuke uh, part. Now, the debate's going to consist of two 10-minute rounds with a five-minute round at the end. They will be timed. There is a timing device in front of me. You will get a green light at eight minutes. You will get a yellow light at nine minutes and a red light at 10 minutes. And our speakers have determined that John will go first, followed by Andy, then John, then Andy, and then at the end you'll have five minutes each to get started. Let me welcome to the podium the director of the Thorium Energy Alliance, John Kutch. Got your cameras rolling there, Sid? Yeah, soon? already. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this has gone off a touch different than what we thought. I had uh, prepared a very beautiful uh, multimedia presentation for you, but otherwise you just have to pretend to use the theater of the mind as I describe this to you. Uh, and so the, the debate at hand as titled in front of you is uh, our authority powered molten salt reactors a solution to U.S. energy needs, or are they just another nuclear boondoggle? Boondoggle, right? So boondoggle is an emotional word. It sums up the reactionary view. The only currency that my opponent has to offer is fear, right? And truth is the death of these people's arguments. Wow, that's not emotional, huh? So, I'm John Cook. I'm the director of the Thorium Energy Alliance. And a little bit about my background. I worked at the National Renewable Energy Lab through my company, Whole World. And uh, we are a design engineering firm. The National Renewable Energy Lab is located in Golden, Colorado. And it is uh, there to uh, help develop mainly solar, but some wind applications. We were working on all sorts of stuff. Solar, wind, run of river hydro, ethanol, organic LEDs, lignin technology, uh, but most of all, dye solar. So I'm not someone who's just coming from this from nowhere. When I say that uh, we know how solar works, and small scale and grid scale, we're very familiar with it. And as you know, familiarity can breed some contempt. I'll show some pictures maybe if you can see this. Uh, I have a farm in Iowa, it's an off-grid farm. It's powered by solar cells. So I have some of the best solar cells in the world and really good batteries. And still, it's almost useless after two or three days. This is as off-grid as you're gonna get. And this is using some of the best technology you can get, and yet, intimately familiar, it is not something that you yourselves would ever want to live with day to day. I'll be happy to talk to you about my experiences with solar and wind and hydro after this. I'll stay till four in the morning if you want. So basically, I'm assuming that my opponent isn't going to be arguing for increasing the amount of coal to be used or other fossil fuels, or to dam up more rivers, I am making the assumption that my opponent 
as the pipe dream of powering this great industrial nation off of so-called renewables. Well, I'll tell you something, renewables do not work. Even National Renewable Energy Lab scientists will admit they do not work. And by work, I mean provide 24-7, 365 base load energy at a level that allows for industry, okay? Not whether you can recharge your cell phone at a campsite, but whether you can actually run steel mills, large base load energy for keeping computing centers open, industry level needs of power. Even the Rocky Mountain Institute, run by a fellow named Amory Lovins, equates going solar and wind to going to natural gas. Robert Kennedy himself, who's fighting offshore wind, knows that the environmental he is, he has to admit that when you go with so-called green technology, what you're really saying is you're going to go with natural gas. Solar and wind on average, over a year in most conditions, and certainly not in Chicago, with our shortened days in the winter and cloud cover and a little thing called snow, in good conditions, Solar and wind only have a 5% uptime, okay? On average, 5% uptime. So the other 95% on average is supplied by what? Peaker plants, natural gas, but today, really, it's coal, right? This is the familiar argument that you may have heard. If you buy a, an electric car in a state other than Illinois, you're really buying a coal-fired car, right? Well, we need base load energy from a proven, walk away safe, clean source of energy that provides the most concentrated form of energy on the planet. We need to move towards a technology called molten salt reactors. Okay, and we'll explain a little bit about that. But basically, I just want to point out that I don't know if you can see this picture, but this is a historic picture of the first large 14 megawatt molten salt reactor. It was called the MSRE, and therefore the debate is over. The truth is I won this debate before it started because the molten salt reactor exists. Boondoggle, by the definition in the OED and uh, the Webster Dictionary, basically implies that it's something that hasn't happened yet, that it's an adventure, that it's a fool's errand. Well, this technology exists. China is producing new ones as we speak. This is proven technology. This reactor ran, and others like it, for thousands of hours. Thousands of hours of proven energy production. The preferred way, and this, the preferred way that we hope to run these reactors, which use a liquid fuel, not solid fuel rods. They use a liquid fuel and the fuel is derived from molten salt. So just like the salt on the table, we get this salt, it melts at a very high temperature and it runs at a very high temperature and those of you who know, the higher temperature, the more efficient we can use it and the most efficient possible version of this would be a thorium fueled molten salt reactor. And it runs on the pure cycle. By the way, if you all want to see the actual full color pretty version of this, I have the presentation on uh, the laptop over there and we will, uh, I'll go through it later for those of you who want to see uh, some of these pictures or want some of the images I can give them to you. But this is the thorium pure cycle, they don't call it the pure cycle for no reason. This produces one one thousandth the waste of a solid fuel <coughs> reactor. Uh, but as I said, I won the debate we can talk till four in the morning about the particulars of how the molten salt reactor works. The more important thing to talk about, these reactors are inherently walk away safe because if the salt drops below 500 degrees, uh, it solidifies. If uh, they, uh, because they use this molten salt, they do not require pressurized reactor ch chambers, so they run at atmosphere, which means you don't need 3,000 psi containment. And they are small, they are inexpensive, they are modular, and above all, they are inherently walk-away safe. And 
they are capable of burning all of the nuclear waste and actinite waste that is sitting in the parking lots of all our nuclear reacting facilities today. All the solid fuel waste that we've accumulated over the last 50 years can be consumed by these uh, uh, molten salt reactors. And here's the greatest thing. Molten salt reactors, they can use uranium for fuel, they can use plutonium fuel, they can use spent fuel actinides as fuel, but if you choose to use thorium as fuel, the thorium fuel is a byproduct of rare earth production. It's free, it's clean, and you don't go mining for thorium the way you go mining for uranium. You get it as a free byproduct from rare earth. So let's talk about rare earth for just a second. Without rare earths, and again a good picture that you all are missing out on, but let's just describe it. Without rare earths, you're not going to have displays on your TV, displays on your phone, you're not going to have uh, electronics in general, the starter on your car, electric cars won't work, neodymium magnets don't work, computers, lights, gyroscopes for cruise missiles, whatever you want to run in the modern society almost always uses some form of rare earths. Not a very well known topic, but our entire life, from those fluorescent lights up there to the computers that you call phones in your pockets run on rare earths. And as of today, China is the only country that uh, produces rare earths. And in the process uh, of, uh, of uh, taking China's monopoly away, the USA could produce rare earths, create great economics, and we would be liberating the greatest energy source in the world. So, uh, with all this good news and opportunity, more important than debating the person who I was supposed to debate, it's important is to get you to the core of what he's going to inevitably claim. And that is that you all should be afraid, that you all should be scared. I get it that radiation is scary. We live in a radioactive world. REMS, RADs, silver, civets, millisieverts, alpha, beta, gamma. The units and amounts mean nothing to most people. You don't have a context to it. So the next chance I have to talk to you, we'll be talking about what radiation really means. Okay. Andy Anderson, if you're ready, let's get up there and get your things going. speaker before I start. I, I wasn't prepared uh, to step in for Dennis. Um, how big are these modular reactors? Uh, uh, you know, uh, one-tenth the size of a normal nuke? Or uh, what, what do you estimate the cost of the average modular reactor to be? Are they going to be... Two million dollars a megawatt. The average size would be 100 megawatts electric to 100 megawatts thermal. And physically, yes, they'd probably be about uh, 15 the size. Of a uh, similar size. Two, you're saying two million dollars a megawatt, but a hundred megawatts would be two billion dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, two hundred million megawatts. Two hundred million dollars for a one hundred megawatt reactor. And a one hundred megawatt reactor is a tenth of the size of the normal thousand megawatt reactors that ComEd has, right? Am I correct, correct on that roughly? Yep. In the ballpark. Yes. So you're not talking about uh, multi-billion dollar installations. You're talking about small modular installations all over the country, backyards and schools, that kind of thing? I don't know about backyards and schools, but uh, repurposing old uh, coal facilities, uh, re repurposing uh, old natural gas facilities. And, you know, they already have setbacks, they're already brownfield sites, and they already have an interconnect uh, to the, uh, the grid. So we would be taking a, a dirty and polluting facility and turning it into a coal, uh, coal free and safe energy facility. Okay, um, I probably have eight minutes left here for my, my part of it. Um, I'll let you start. Oh, we can, we can. The, um, I was preparing for, uh, you know, to give, I, I brought some literature myself. We pulled some literature pieces out of the archives that were written uh, 20 to 25 years ago. Um, when you say the debate is over, he's absolutely correct. The debate on several points was over in 1985. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, the first 10 minutes here, I feel like I was listening to a, 
a, a, a longtime veteran sports writer that lived in Chicago for the last 20 years and gave us a history of the Chicago Bulls and claimed that he never heard of Michael. Uh, or somebody that lived in the Vatican for 25 years and says, oh, what Paul? Uh, you know, uh, there's a classic book out. It's called Charles Ferguson just wrote this. If you want to stand, understand what's happening in America, this book is called Predator Nation. It's new. There's a whole chapter. There's a whole chapter in this book uh, talking about the ivory tower, universities, think tanks. You can pour several hundred dollars into uh, a think tank or a project somewhere, and they will produce a report basically saying the earth is flat on almost any subject you can give them. Their brains for hire. And I'm guessing that the Thorium Alliance is made up of well-paid people that are brains for hire. Um, there's an ancient Chinese proverb saying, uh, you cannot make up a man, wake up a man who is pretending to be asleep. Sinclair Lewis said it in 1935. 1935, you cannot make a man understand something if his salary depends on his not understanding it. We were inundated. Uh, a lot of the people that were inundated with the phrase, too cheap to meter, clean, safe, and too cheap to meter, a lot of those people are old and have died off. Now, there's some that are in their 80s that were in uh, the pioneering how many people here in this audience are familiar with a man named John Goffman? Raise your hands. Anybody familiar with Goffman's work? A handful. Uh, Goffman wrote a, with Arthur Temple, and they published a book called Poison Power in 1969. In, in 1967, the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC, uh, the people that wanted to give us 1,600 nuclear power plants on American soil in 1967. They said uh, the best reactor uh, safety record we can hope to achieve is one major re reactor accident every thousand years worth of reactor service. Well, one Chernobyl in a thousand years doesn't sound too bad. But somebody asked this fellow, he said, well, what about, in, you know, if you expect to have a thousand to 1,600 reactors running by the year 2000, what does that mean for safety? Well, the man from the Atomic Energy Commission said, you know, this is 1967. You have to remember that 33 years from now, in the year 2000, the country will be overpopulated enough that the public is just going to have to get used to one blast a year and a few thousand dead in exchange for cheap electricity. <laughs> one Chernobyl per year, one, one Fukushima per year on American soil was considered acceptable in exchange for what they thought would be a cheap source of electricity from nuclear power, from these billion dollar entities. Now, uh, I, I downloaded, and uh, there's all kinds of reports you can read on uh, the Thorium Alliance and the research that's going on. There's uh, a problem with uh, all kinds of corrosive atoms uh, you know, forming and migrating through the pipes, uh, you know, forming all kinds of uh, corrosive breakdown problems. These things haven't been solved yet. The, the research is still going on. They may have a small demonstration reactor running somewhere or two, but uh, the Chinese are doing research. They don't have 150 or 200 reactors running all over the place like uh, the debate is set. Now, I would ask my opponent to say right up front, uh, are private insurance companies going to insure these things, or uh, is the Price-Anderson Act going to have to be renewed so that insurance companies won't uh, stand behind them? Is, to my knowledge, uh, the American Wall Street, the articles that are showing up right now are showing that Wall Street is one of the most anti-nuclear entities on the planet. Wall Street will not back with in independent funding on uh, nuclear power. Uh, and there's, there's two books that were published back in, oh, 30 years ago. This one is called Brill Power. And it's about uh, our whole energy system. It's not an anti-nuclear book per se. It's a book, the first half of the book is about coal, oil, natural gas, uh, all kinds of problems uh, that the grid has to storms, disruptions, all kinds of things. The last half of this book it was published by Henry Hunter Levins. This was a book that evolved out of a, 
a book they did in, in conjunction, uh, a report for the Pentagon, Energy Strategy for National Security. If a country is going to be secure, how should they be spending their energy dollars? And the last half of this book is about everything you need to know for designing a, an entire energy system for resilience and reliability, right? And even if nuclear power plants, the big billion dollar entities, didn't have any radioactive problems that we've become familiar with over the last 30 years, even if they were safe, they are vulnerable to all kinds of problems that dispersed energy is not. Uh, if you do a Google search of what's happening in Germany right now, the latest coming out of Germany says that they are, they are achieving a blend of wind, solar, uh, alternate energy, uh, various kinds of electrical storage, energy storage. Germany is uh, rapidly solving the problem that uh, my opponent said about the sun only shines 5%. Uh, it, you want me to come over there and stand right in your face? You, you, are terrifying, off of you, are terrifying, you are terrifyingly ignorant of what's going on. I won't put up with that for another night. You stood up here and were ignorant a few weeks ago when I gave a speech. And we're not going to have that tonight. Yeah, if, you're gonna, if, you, if you want to participate, then you have the rebuttal time. I get to interrupt the speech. Okay. <laughs> the Wall Street Journal in 1985 published a report uh, uh, on, it wasn't the Wall Street Journal, I'm sorry, it was uh, Forbes, Forbes magazine. They talked about nuclear follies. And at that time they said, the nuclear power industry has lost more money on the nuclear power than we spent on the entire Vietnam War. In 1985, the nuclear industry was then considered the largest financial industrial disaster in American history. Now, these things uh, have the, the mechanics, you know, the economics have not gotten better over the years. I have some handouts tonight that uh, Xerox copies you can log on and search for yourself. Countries all over the world are in the process of phasing out of nuclear power and going to cheaper, safer alternatives. And the idea that the sun only shines, you know, 5% of the time, uh, that's a, a right-wing talking point from the intellectual prostitutes from the ivory tower. These people are paid to tell us that there's no problem with second-hand smoke, no problem with asbestos dust in the factories. It takes years and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of lawsuits for the truth to uh, leak out that we're being lied to. We're just being flat out lied to and the presentations are very slick, very well polished. Martin Luther King, if any of you are familiar with any of his quotes, Martin Luther King said way back in the 60s, he said, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere stupidity and conscientious ignorance. You have people that think they know what's going on and they're conscientiously ignorant I'll, I'll make up, what do you have, two minutes, Tim, one minute? About, a, about maybe, uh, actually, I would, take, I, take, take, take I, a little I more was, time. 30 seconds. I was very, very pro-nuclear. I thought our future was nuclear power. I installed electricity in my home for electric heat. I thought we would have clean, safe electricity out of nukes everywhere in 1980. That was before I started to read and learn about how many nuclear scientists were on uh, the payroll uh, they were nuclear scientists developing nuclear power, and then they went on the campaign trail to, uh, as whistleblowers, speaking out of what we know today about the large disaster. That's why we don't have 1,600, 1600 nukes running all over the United States. We have 104. So that will, that's my start. Um, let's see what how it evolves tonight. Okay. Let's welcome back John. We don't have chart. Uh, we've already got started, Charlie. Let's uh, get moving. Ready, John? Just let me know when. Okay, go ahead. All right. So most of you don't know what base. You know what the a lot of folks pretend is that there's such a thing as a, a zero radiation risk, but there is uh, right now. My little Geiger counter radiation detector. In uh, Chicago in general, but right in this room, we're having a 0.12 millisieverts an hour of cosmic rays, alpha, beta, 
So, 0.1 millisieverts an hour. We hear about radioactive water and uh, from Connecticut Yankee nuclear power, or more recently Fukushima. You know, all the all the tritium uh, created by Connecticut Yankee in one day is less than the radioactive potassium that's found in one banana. Okay, so one airplane flight, one airplane flight on average is going to give you about 39 times background radiation. So about 3.9 millisieverts, right? So on the ground here, we're going to get about 0.1 millisieverts. Up in the air, you're going to get 3.9 millisieverts per hour. And uh, you just generally don't see uh, airline captains falling dead from, from extreme exposure to 39 times the radiation that they would see on the ground. You live in Denver, you live on a giant pile of granite, radioactive granite, a mile high in the sky, you're being exposed to a constant 2.5 millisieverts, so about 25 times more radiation. Point is that we live in a very radioactive world. Uh, we need context. People say radiation and people go running for the hills, but uh, uh, we need context so that folks like the Nuclear Energy Information Service of Illinois which is a, a division of Beyond Nuclear and folks like the Union of Concerned Scientists, they play on you and uh, the media's lack of understanding in this. So they know they can just say the word radiation and people will go running and crying. Uh, but the fact is that like for Fukushima, you know, you hear about this radioactive water and what I'd like to show you is that Fukushima, the result of Fukushima, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be on par with this. Can anyone see that? This city, you know what city that is? 1.2 million people living in a very high tech city? That's Hiroshima, Japan. So it's not a brown radioactive landscape burnt to the ground. It's a thriving metropolis. Nagasaki is another million people city. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to think about the fact that uh, Fukushima is gonna be lingering on forever and ever here. All right, so a few other things for you. Helium, lava, plate tectonics, it's all caused, for the most part, by nuclear reactions happening in the, the Earth's uh, core. All right, so uh, a lot of the things that provide life, that give us the atmosphere we need, those are all the results of, uh, uh, of natural, quote unquote, natural nuclear energy. So life developed in a radioactive world. I want you to think, if you believe that radiation has a half-life, We'll go back three billion years when life evolved. The Earth was hundreds of times more radioactive than it is today. So life on Earth evolved. Dinosaurs evolved. Single cell animals evolved. An incredibly burning hot radioactive world that we wouldn't be able to survive in today. But life thrived in it. So our cells have that ability, have that information in them in order to, to uh, heal themselves. This is similar to exposing yourself to sunlight. You just need some common sense, right? Too little sunlight and you get vitamin D deficiency and you're not very healthy. Too much sunlight over a long exposure might give you a skin cancer, or at the very least a sunburn. So that is a form of radiation that we've learned to deal with that we can understand. So we know now that the only thing that's gonna really save civilization is small distributed nuclear power uh, it's the only thing that's going to create truly carbon-free energy. And that's why you're here, right? To learn about this. This is the College of Complexes, so I'm, I appreciate you learning about this. So the, public, uh, the public's understanding of risk is a little limited, and uh, I want to uh, make sure people know that there's no such thing as free energy, no matter what energy source you love the most. Solar, wind, natural gas, diesel fuel, wave energy, or nuclear, they all have extreme costs, very large costs. In 50 years of USA power reactor commercial operations, there have been zero operator deaths in the USA. Now, there have been many, many deaths in the natural gas industry, in oil field workers, and people who install solar cells get electrocuted and fall off buildings and get crushed all the time. So there's deaths in this chart, if you want to come up later and look at the PDF, but the chart shows that for every 2,500 megawatts of power, uh, uh, 2,500 gigawatts of power created by solar, there's one death. For every 7.9 million 
gigawatts of power created by nuclear, there's a death. So there's death involved with any power you're going to talk about. You pick your favorite power, and I'm going to show you how it kills people. Our oceans, just a few other little facts, our oceans have millions and millions of pounds of dissolved uranium in them. Uranium is a water-soluble. Thorium, by the way, is not water-soluble, so it can't get into groundwater. Uh, and people, I want you to think about it, we're, we're a good 65 years into the nuclear age, right? People have been working with intense radiation for decades, and you aren't hearing about millions of people falling down dead with growths and tumors. Uh, this puts a lie to the idea that, oh, the, the radiation, their zero exposure is the only acceptable rate. There are people who work with very high levels of exposure. For instance, naval uh, reactor operators live literally within feet of some of the most powerful, intensely powerful reactors on the planet and their life expectancies are fine. So let's go to the la some of the last points here. Millions of lives every year are saved by nuclear. Thousands of cold deaths are offset every year by nuclear, not to mention billions of pounds of CO2. Reactors turn Soviet bombs into energy. We just turned our 18,000th warhead from Russia into nuclear power. Perhaps you didn't realize that Chicago, right now, 70% of the power in this room is from nuclear reactors. Illinois gets 55% of its power from nuclear. Chicago itself gets over 70% of its power from nuclear. So 18,000 warheads have been turned into nuclear fuel. That means right now, 10% of the energy in this country, 10% of this energy in this country is made from disposed nuclear weapons. So it's the ultimate. If you believe in non-proliferation, trying to get rid of nuclear weapons, you better keep the nuclear reactors running, especially molten salt reactors. Uh, I really, it's a shame I can't show you this, but this is a, a room in France, a room, one single room in France where they keep every last bit of spent nuclear fuel that they've ever used to power their country. Most of you know that France is 80% powered by nuclear and all their waste is kept in one room. Coal can't say that, even solar can't say that. And believe me, solar has lots of waste. Uh, renewables, here's the damning thing that nobody wants to think about. Renewables push the cost of environmental, you know, feeling good about the environment. You want to build solar cells, inevitably they're going to be built in China. This is a picture of riots in China because all the solar cell factories there are run incredibly poorly. They're putting cadmium, arsenic, telluride into the water. People are dying so that people in the West and Germany can get their solar and claim that they're uh, 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 doing something good for the earth. So we're sending jobs, we're sending technology, as well as vast sums of money to China because China controls a monopoly on the rare earths, China controls solar cell production, China controls windmill production because windmills neodymium, need neodymium. So China controls energy. We're going to swap Saudi Arabia for China. Now, the quickest safest thing we could do is stop using very much energy, right? But even if the United States became 100% efficient, even if we disappeared from the map, we are nothing anymore. Get over it. China and India, 2.5 billion people are wanting to live like we do. If we stop using energy, any energy at all, the amount that they are increasing is going to be equal to 3, 4, 7 United States. So if you're going to be parochial and go back and look at Oh, are molten salt reactors a solution for U.S. energy needs? Yes, they are, but more importantly, they're the solution for world energy needs because we can't power a world on coal the way China is, is powering it, and even China knows that. That's why China is spending the money to develop molten salt reactors. So, you know, I just want to let you know if we could uh, spend some time going up there. I could show you that they actually brag about how much materials windmills take. Uh, 50,000 pounds of concrete, 38,000 pounds of plastic. But you know the trouble with windmills, they still use thousands of gallons of lubricating oils. People fall off of them and die. They blow up. They use Chinese rare earths. These are not the jobs creators people think. You know, solar, solar as I said, is, a, is just as polluting as any other energy source. It's just that if you look at this picture, this is a picture of how they get the materials for their, their energy. Uh, so when you, build, when you buy a solar cell from China, you're buying a machine that was made with filthy, dirty coal, right? 
So the energy deficit in solar is quite extreme. It's solar power made with the filthiest power available. Okay. Okay. Let's see here from. Okay, Andy, 10 minutes. Once again, um, I'd like to point out it takes time. You know, the average, the average person does not have time to read 10 or 20 books a week on a subject. So when some well-funded campaign gets started, uh, putting out facts that it normally takes a person a little time to research, it's very difficult for the average person to form a rebuttal in real time. Uh, Robert Shear is one of our best investigative reporters, and he wrote a book in 1983 called With Enough Shovels. His, his book still stands as a classic because we had a, an executive from Boeing Aircraft the, I mean, T.K. Jones became the Under Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Operations. T.K. Jones' job was to travel around the country having speeches and presentations like this one with our business leaders, teaching them there's no problem with nuclear war as long as every American has his own shovel and dig his own foxhole. You dig a, dig a trench out back, six feet deep, throw a couple doors over it, pile the dirt up, and then the, you, you crawl in and sit under that and as a radioactive cloud drifts over, we'll get back to normal in a couple of days. Uh, a bunch of scientists, phys physicians for social responsibility, some people, uh, you know, like from the, the so-called anti-nuclear groups, a lot of doctors stopped playing golf on Wednesdays and formed groups that would, you know, help counter this kind of well-funded propaganda that's 100% out of touch with observable reality. That's what we're hearing tonight, like we heard two years ago on the so-called debate between the pros and cons of 9-11. The way you so-called win a debate like this is you just say, well, your opponent has uh, no real information and it's over. Just, you know, uh, the way you win a debate is just stand up there and put out bald-faced lies, false information, stuff that's been disproven because the average person, if they haven't read these books, wouldn't know, you know, that, that there's an enormous amount of evidence to the contrary. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's a flyer that uh, we published, we summarized, this is a summary of like a hundred books on this whole issue back from 1989, the issue of nuclear power versus everything else. It's called Nuclear Power and the Greenhouse Effect, you can have one, I brought a stack of these things. Basically, as an energy source, nuclear power is the largest financial industrial disaster in history. It's now understood, this was 1989, that nuclear power, nuclear power plants provide the facade for a civilian, the civilian facade for a nuclear power and nuclear weapons program. The nuclear power plants cost so much money to build, you have to have a police force to safeguard these facilities that they will push a country toward uh, becoming a totalitarian police state. And in every country on earth that is uh, thinking about building more nuclear power plants, they're also increasing the police levels to guard these things. There's, uh, we, in 1985, we published an article called The Benefits of Nuclear Power. There's five distinct benefits that you can uh, pinpoint. One of them is bankruptcy. Uh, nuclear power plants will push a utility toward bankruptcy because there's no realistic way to recover the billions by selling kilowatts. That has uh, been well established and anything counteractive to that is just an outright pipe dream. Secondly, nuclear power provides all the material you need to process uranium and other things to make portable atomic bombs job security for the secret police. I mentioned that. Uh, 
nuclear power plants have to be guarded. They're a central technology. Solar panels and windmills don't need an army of secret police. Uh, also, the idea that we still need to use large amounts of energy was disproven in Illinois here in 1979 out of a town called Schaumburg where they started building houses that have no furnaces that heat for 10 bucks a month. And that was before they had the good new triple pane windows that are as good as an insulated wall. You can build a freestanding house anywhere now that will run on a, a few square yards of solar cells on the roof with a refrigerator that runs on a dime a day worth of electricity. Basically, you don't need any sizable heating and cooling for indoor human comfort. You have air exchangers. Uh, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, a whole bunch of countries are way ahead of America in developing. I held up that book a little while ago. If, if any of you are interested, this book is a summary. Of, it says, Bold Business Solutions for the New Energy Era. It came out of Rocky Mountain Institute. It's called Reinventing Fire. This is a catalog of all kinds of things that are happening. My opponent here, for how many minutes now, has been saying, that's not happening. The world can't do that. That's a pipe dream. Uh, I wonder if he's familiar with the houses all through Canada, Germany, Schaumburg, from Aurora to the Wisconsin border that have no furnace that heat for $10 a month. Uh, the new LED lights use one eighth as much current as a normal incandescent light. They last a long time. Uh, the solar, if you log on to something called the solar decathlon. Every two years there's a de solar decathlon held. It was in Washington for the last few years. Washington, D.C. I think it's out in California this year. It comes out in September, October. The solar decathlon is a contest, a decathlon college contest where colleges build, their engineering departments build 800 square foot <laughs> transportable freestanding houses that are powered by the light that falls on them every day. And they're not using coal, oil, gas, and nuclear or anything else, what Harvey Wasserman refers to as King Kong, coal, oil, nukes, and gas. Um, these houses can be scaled up 2,000, 3,000 square feet, just you put a little few more yards of solar panels on the roof, but the high efficiency technologies that are available today require a fifth to a tenth as much energy as we took for granted 20 years ago. In, in this book that was published in 1980, there's a chart in here uh, on the best brains from Avery Lovins on the low end to uh, Natural Resources, Defense Council, some colleges, and then the, the Department of Energy. They published a chart. Avery estimated that the country could use 125 quadrillion BTUs. The government people were estimating to use 190 quads by the year 2000. This was, he simply collected the estimates from 1972. Every two years, he published updates. And by 1980, the government, the guzzlers that claimed we were going to be burning a lot of coal and oil and everything else, their estimate in 1980, what the energy consumption of the United States would be, their estimate was lower than what they considered Amory Lovins insane for eight years earlier. That's how fast the level of awareness was spreading that uh, the same thing, if Amory talks about his cell phone, he holds up his cell phone and he says, today people don't take it for granted but you don't realize that a cell phone today has more computer power than the Strategic Air Command had back when Avery was in high school. We have cheap cell phones, DVD players, uh, portable computers. Uh, a lot of this stuff is going through the uh, information learning curve. How many minutes? Uh, you got about uh, two more minutes. Okay. Uh, Commonwealth, I'll talk a minute for Commonwealth Edison, the Edison Electric Institute which is not known to be a bastion of dope-smoking hippies left over from 1983. Their report sounds like it was written by those from 1983. Edison Electric Institute put out a report in January this year saying that things are happening so fast, the cost of installed solar is dropping so fast, it's dropped 85% in the last 20 years, 
that if it's come, they expected to come down another dollar per watt. They said at today's prices, that report, 26 page report out of the Nuclear Edison Electric Institute, heavy promoters of nuclear power said 17% of America has cheaper solar today, depending on what part of the country they live in. And Edison is looking at not being stuck like Kodak felt. Kodak had to file bankruptcy because they weren't paying attention to the people were going digital all around them. And the, the people that made eight track tapes, their factories went out of business. And, and uh, the ones that stayed in business, they made cassettes, then they made CDs, and now we have iPods. Uh, the whole information structure, uh, you know, the, the structure is changing and moving forward. We're getting rapid beneficial change on many different fronts. Many, many different fronts of rapid beneficial change. I'll try to summarize that in my last five minutes. Thank you. Okay. A reminder to our speakers, a green light will go on at four minutes, a yellow light will go on at four minutes, 30 seconds, and a red light will go on at five minutes. Up next is John Kutch for his final... Are we, are we doing the questions first? No, we're going to have a chance after the questions and after after the rebuttals. This is your final remarks on the debate, and then after we do the questions and, and the uh, rebuttals, you'll get a chance to get the last strike, the last word. All right, so if you're ready, we've got five minutes for concluding remarks of the debate portion. Let me know when. We can make it seven if you'd like. Sure, that'd be great. Has everybody agreed that we can give our uh, each member seven minutes instead of... We're a little ahead of schedule, so we'll go seven minutes. That means I'll go five, six, and seven on the lights. So go ahead and let's get started. What's your name again? Andy. Andy? I want to thank Andy for uh, picking up the yoke with uh, probably no time to uh, get... Uh, you know, uh, a presentation together. I know that sucks to be called flat-footed, and uh, I know that uh, uh, he would have had even better things to uh, go through uh, if he had some warning. Uh, you know, uh, but what I do have to say is Andy really has to uh, come up to today. This isn't 1985. We are not talking about solid fuel, light water, 1,400 megawatt reactors. Uh, this is another unfortunate thing about not being able to have a presentation that uh, I planned, but we are talking about molten salt, small modular reactors, inherently safe, walk away safe, that are using salts that uh, cannot boil over uh, during, uh, uh, during a nuclear operation. They do not break down. The, the coolant and the fuel are the same thing. There's no such thing as a loss of coolant accident. These reactors don't run at 3,000 PSI. They run at atmosphere, which means you could literally open one up while it was running and look at it, if you were impervious to neutrons, that is. So this is, and though the trouble is, this technology existed in 1985. So hopefully uh, the trouble is, you know, uh, it was an orphan technology uh, because of uh, things in the 1970s that uh, made for poor decisions. I, I want to also point out that the fuel that I prefer, even though these reactors, uh, molten salt reactors, can use pretty much any nuclear fuel, uranium, plutonium, actinide, spent fuel from uh, existing nuclear power plants. You know, we don't have Yucca Mountain. How are we going to get rid of that fuel? Well, there's still 95 to 99 percent of the energy left in those fuel rods. Why don't we get some use out of it? 500 years worth of energy is tied up in the parking lots of uh, our nuclear power plants. Uh, just to give you an idea of how energy dense thorium is uh, when used in a molten salt reactor, this is a 32 millimeter sphere, representative sphere, it's not actually thorium, but if it were thorium I'd probably have trouble holding it up. Very dense, this would weigh probably about 12, 14 pounds. Very dense stuff. And that's all the thorium you would use in your entire life from birth to death, airplane flights, eating your house, driving your car, all the energy you would use in your life would come from that much fuel. So if you just think about it in terms of like how much do we have to mine, getting rid of mountaintop removal, getting rid of the, uh, the need to mine aluminum to make frames for solar cells, 
getting rid of the fracking that's needed to do geo uh, geo seismic type uh, uh, geothermal heating. Uh, you know, any kind of uh, energy you need is going to require extracting resources from the earth. Why don't we choose to use the most energy dense, safest form of energy that we've ever discovered? Right? I mean, wouldn't it be smart if we really care about the earth? Why use diffuse, unreliable, dilapidated energy in the form of of windmills, solar cells, put in far flung where where the the energy losses through transmission and Again, uh, I am sorry that Andy is under the uh, impression that cheap solar is a good thing. Cheap solar is great for us in the West, just like cheap DVDs players and cheap cell phones. But who is paying the price for this? It's not a joke anymore, the hippie sitting there going, no nukes, man. It's like, well, that could have been laughed off. But now it's really mattering. All of your flat screen TVs and the starters on your cars, all the fluorescent lights you buy, those cost a lot. And you are not paying the price for them. It's the poor people in China, the poor people in Australia, the poor people in Africa. You heard of blood diamonds? Well, these are blood materials that we need to make our, our electronics and our other advanced alloys today. If you care, if you care really about making a difference, well then I suggest you choose and look in and choose to talk to me later about molten salt reactor technology. But if you still don't, if you still are afraid of nuclear reactors, look, they, they're so scary, there's things that you don't know about them that could do things that might cause tumors. I don't know. Well, you don't know, and, and I'm here to help, uh, help you understand. But if you still, through all that, have to get rid of radiation in your life, then get rid of gasoline which uses cerium to break itself. Uh, no x-ray machines for you. So if you have a, a broken bone or something, no x-ray machines. No natural gas, because you get natural gas out of the ground and radon comes with that. By the way, you better fill your basement up with limestone, because your basement, especially if you're in Chicago, is full of radon. No cat litter. The clay that makes up cat litter is, is uh, very radioactive. No bananas. Can't eat bananas because they're full of radioactive potassium. Oh, and by the way, rip the bones and teeth out of your body because your bones and teeth are made out of radioactive potassium. And most of all, you better take care of this. All these smoke detectors, every smoke detector in the world, all the ones that are in this building and the ones in your house, use ionizing radiation made from plutonium, made from the weapons industry. The terrible, terrible weapons industry brought us nothing but unease and war. Well, no, that didn't. It brought us americium, and americium is what lets us, you know, detect the smoke. So that is a lot of ionizing radiation. And I bet you guys never cared one lick about your smoke detectors until you heard this, right? And if you put your smoke detector in the garbage and you don't care about it, apparently you don't really care about radiation, and apparently you really aren't all that scared about radiation. Because you're willing to put these radioactive things in your house when it's willing to save your life. You're willing to get an x-ray when it saves your life. But what you have to do is save everyone's life on this planet. you got to learn that the only way this planet is going to prosper is by thorium-powered molten salt reactor technology that the entire world can use. And that's all I have to say for that. Okay. Okay, seven minutes, Andy. John's doing an excellent job uh, summarizing the talking points to change the focus of you know uh, the problems of these reactors away from you know the reality. There's a 28-page uh, summary of uh, current summary off of Wikipedia uh, describing the, the benefits and the disadvantages, everything anybody needs to know if they're going to support uh, thorium economy. 
I'll just take a couple of minutes here. This, this is from the, you know, the, the, the write-up on thorium. The start up fuel, you're going to need uranium or plutonium or something else. Thorium doesn't start up by itself. The thorium reactors are going to be working with uranium, plutonium, uh, other kinds of radioactive materials that we found uh, do cause cancer and leukemia if they leak out in the water and the air around the plants. Beryllium toxicity is another one. Loss of delayed neutrons. Waste management. There's going to be a need for waste management for the fission products. In the fluoride form, they're highly water soluble. Fluorides are less suited long for long term storage. Uh, these things migrate. Decommissioning costs are uncertain yet. Uh, what we learned uh, over the last 30 years is that decommissioning costs, when a reactor finally has to be decommissioned and shut down, invariably uh, the estimates are vastly higher than what we were told when they were starting to get built. Noble metal buildup. Some of the radioactive fission products, such as noble metals, don't form salts, but deposit somewhere in the piping. This includes the reprocessing plant part, and that is not well tested. Equipment such as nickel wool sponge cartridges will have to be developed to filter and trap the noble metals and prevent them from building up excessively in the piping, reprocessing plant and heat exchanger over time. So you, you have these buildups that will begin to affect the operation of the plant. Limited graphite lifetime. The graphite heats up and it gets brittle over time and it's going to have to be replaced every four years. Graphite, it says, causes a positive reactivity feedback. That means that if you get too much of the thermal materials in one spot, you could get a, a it says it could cause an undesirable positive feedback. Well, that's like a small uh, explosion of some kind or a chain reaction. The solubility for plutonium is limited. It's going to be a problem dealing with the plutonium. Proliferation. Potential proliferation risk from reprocessing. These things are not walk away safe. There's, there are proliferation risks. They're going to be all over the place. The more you have running, these things running, the more you're going to have to safeguard all the materials they're used, stored, processed in the normal operating cycle of these things. Proliferation of Neptunium-237, that's another one. Neutron poisoning and tritium production from lithium-6, all kinds of problems with that. These are corrosive salts that have a tendency to leak out through seals, they migrate. Uh, if you're talking about high temperature, you know, uh, 800, 900 degrees Fahrenheit or better, with corrosive salts, there's all kinds of problems with uh, the metals. And one of my favorites here is business model. They have to say uh, today's solid reactor vendors, they make long-term revenues by making a profit on fuel fabrication. Without any fuel to fabricate and sell, the light, the, the new, this new reactor generation would require we'd have to adapt to a different business model. That is to say, you have to develop some other way to extract the money from a defenseless population that doesn't want to pay for these monstrosities. We've heard over and over again the same tired old argument that's been rebuilt, reclothed, you know, there's an old saying, the emperor has new clothes. No, the emperor has no clothes. Well, if you dress up the argument, and again, we need people speaking out saying, the emperor has no clothes. The idea that we can't use solar is completely, just simply false, incorrect, on a massive scale worldwide. Uh, countries are going solar. A lot of scientists, uh, a figure that's commonly accepted is a ratio of 10,000 to 1. Many, many places have published this. The human race uses enough energy that would equal 1 10,000th of the daily solar intake. We capture 1 10,000th of the daily solar intake with proper storage and everything else, and you don't need any coal, oil, gas, or any kind of nuclear power plant. And the cost of this 
is rapidly coming down where it's going to be cheaper than any kind of uh, fossil fuel or nuclear power. The blend in Germany is already working with a blend of solar, wind, and renewables, as I said earlier, so they, they have solved the so-called base load problem. And Amory pointed out, if you have wind farms scattered around, the wind is always blowing somewhere. When one of them is sitting idle, the wind is blowing somewhere else. If they're dispersed enough all over the country and they're feeding power into the grid, you know, the national grid can be managed with intake of solar and wind. And uh, solar will provide peak power during the day when people use air conditioners the most. I'd like to address the concept of if we cared about making a difference. Um, a lot of us care about making a difference, and that's why we don't sit back silent when somebody is promoting something that is very, very far out of touch with the reality, but is designed to rake in billions and billions of welfare dollars from the United States taxpayers. Nuclear power as we know it today exists on massive welfare for billionaires, welfare at the top. Uh, and this new generation would be no different. It would be uh, subsidized, massively subsidized, while at the same time ignoring the cheaper energy efficiency alternatives that are uh, too numerous to mention. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Let's thank both of our speakers tonight again, and I really do want to appreciate again Andy Anderson stepping up to the plate in the absence of Dennis Nelson. Now I'm going to turn over control of this uh, festivities to Brom to take our questions and uh, then we'll go into the rebuttal period. We'll probably do questions until about 10 o'clock and then we'll go into our rebuttal period where you guys will have a chance to rebut the rebutters, I mean to rebut the things and of course our speakers at the end of the night get the last word. So Brom, if you're ready. Very good. All right. Our first question comes from uh, Mr. Fong. Just a very fast one. Uh, you made the comment that on your farm, your solar setup is useless after two or three days. Why is that? Right. Well, it was it where I said I'd uh, be happy to talk about the particulars uh, later, but the, here's what it is. We, we've got uh, uh, We've got about one kV of uh, solar, and then we have uh, a battery array, and the amount, I mean, it's that simple. The, ba the, 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 the array that we are willing to pay for and the batteries that we have just don't have enough energy to supply, the, uh, supply what we need. You know, if we're running more than just, you know, a radio or something, you know, it can't, and we have all LED lighting, everything's DC. DC fans, you know, so it should be the most efficient possible way to use that power. And yet, as a guy who worked for National Renewable Energy Lab and had some pretty good advice on how to set it up, even that, you know, uh, doesn't work very well. So again, we have to go back to the well, spend more money, put up more solar cells. And here's a little dirty secret about solar cells that their promoters don't like to talk about. But if you go to NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, they're more than happy to talk about, well, you know, solar cells are like everything else. Right out of the box, they might make 8, 9, 12% efficient energy conversion. But as time goes on and the glass gets scratched and the dirt builds up and things short out, you know, by 5, 10, 15 years, you're seeing this constant degradation. You know, it's another reason why most solar cells, and I can't stress this enough, most solar cells never make more energy than was put into their manufacture. I mean, if that doesn't bother you, I, I can't help you. If you don't understand that, the power that was used to mine the materials, melt it down, fabricate the solar cells, all that energy on this side of the ledger sheet is never made up by the amount of electrons captured by the solar cell itself. 
It still doesn't, you haven't answered my question. I did answer the question. Not, why we didn't this, size it big enough. This, why because I wasn't willing to spend the money, because I could, for $7,000, I could have had uh, a line brought in from the, the power lines. And I, I wanted to try and keep it off the grid, so we have a very small windmill that we use, and we have a, a relatively uh, a small solar cell array that has all week to charge while we're not there, and it just, it's not enough to support our, our very, very modest energy use. And my point is, that's what's gonna happen when you try and convert your house. Or that's what happens when you try and do what? Convert the Sears Tower, the Cormac Place? I mean, sure, maybe you can get your house to run on it, but you can't run industry on it. You cannot run industry. Well, that's not what you said. You said the system was useless after two or three days. It is you useless to... because it's out of power after two or three days. Yeah, uh, what else is there to understand? No explanation. That is not <laughs> I, I can't. No sense. No sense. All right, let's go on. All right, next. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to start from the back here. Uh, this, the dub. Yeah, um, the thorium, of course, is not the fissile material. Could you elaborate about why the isotope of uranium, the U? Uh, 233, I believe it is, is superior in your thorium reactor. It comes from the absorption of the neutrons by the thorium. Uh, it, it's superior to the uranium 235, that's the fissile material in the typical reactors used today. So, the way I like to describe the, the, the process is this the, you know, if you imagine the, the uh, molten salt reactor is like a candle, right? And the wax of the candle is the fuel. It's, it's solid at room temperature. And, and no matter how many candles you put in one room, they're not going to light on fire, right? You know, they're just, they're, they're fizzled, they're not fertile. You need a match to get the process going. And the match is a very tiny amount of a neutron source. So you either use uranium-235, plutonium, you can use a, an accelerator. Our friends down at Fermilab are using neutron spallation as the, as the match to start the process. So what, now the preferred thing that you're talking about is uranium-233. You use a relatively small amount of uranium-233, and I can show on the laptop over there the, the pure cycle of thorium-232 absorbs a neutron, it, uh, it then uh, splits off, becomes uranium-233. The uranium-233 sort of passes through protactinium, loses its uh, neutron, starting another reaction again. So, so it's very, there, there's not a lot of other things coming off of it. That's why it's called the pure cycle, is that the thorium is turning into uranium-233, which is turning back into thorium-232. And so there's very, very uh, little waste when you use the per, the pure cycle like that. There but, are that fissile answer? products, correct? I'm sorry? There are fissile products. There are some, but like a thousandth of what a solid fuel reactor would, would make. Just product? Yes, sir. Back to you. At the beginning of your first 10 minutes, you referred to the loaded word boondoggle. Yep. Okay. And then you went on to use the word reactionary. I'm curious, I don't recall the drift as to who you were referring to when you used that word. I'm referring to people that are using fear as their main argument rather than, you know, uh, scientific reasoning and actual, you know, uh, business studies and actual okay. information. All right, let me put it to you this way. Are, is there, are there any opponents of your position who you would consider not to be reactionary? Uh, <laughs> sure, I mean, anyone who wanted to just come and say, all right, let's compare apples to apples. How much energy does this particular system put out per resources invested in it? You know, I mean, that's a, a simple example. If someone's just willing to come and say, all right, well, I can make two megawatts of energy from an Avangoa uh, windmill, uh, but I have to build uh, some of those windmill components in Spain, I have to bring them to the United States, and I have to, you know, assemble them, and then I have to get the actual generator from China, and, and so we're shipping parts all over the world using thousands and thousands of pounds of material to make a mere two megawatts uh, of energy, 
And and then they go, okay, how about you? And I could say, well, for you know, for that same thing, we can locally source all this material. We get our fuel for free. It'll run for years and years and years and generate, you know, a vast amount of energy for much less investment per megawatt. I mean, if that's I mean, if that's what you're going to do, just bring it down to like, how much energy do you get for the resources invested? As long as he wins. Well, I'm trying to understand if I can follow the whole more follow up uh, Are you continuing the same question? Oh yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand this. Leaving aside this or that particular scientific or quasi scientific objection or would be objection, can you imagine anybody having any other sorts of reservations? About what you propose. Sure, that they're going to they're going to have reservations because they've been told all their life that they should have reservations. So it's not reaction. But the but the people, the people who have reservations, have been misled. They've been given no frame of reference for why they have reservations. I mean, if, if I ask anyone in this room, hey, do you have reservations about the molten salt reactor? Oh yeah, man, it still makes you know you know fissionable uh, waste products. I I don't understand. Uh, you know, uh, noble metals might play out. A, does anybody even really understand that? So it's like if if you want to understand that before you go, oh my God. Well, what do you say? Oh my God, to you probably don't understand what the implications are, and whether they're good or bad. Or whether you know the materials uh, used are are robust enough to withstand you know continue. I mean the whole point is you don't is even know that because that was not tested. Just, the temperature uh, just uh, you made your point. Brian, you're out of order. So he's he's misleading the time. Brian, you know that. You know that. You know that. You know Oh, yeah, yeah, just a couple of days. Loud, please, if you don't mind. Sure. A couple of days, questions. One, uh, where would, or where is, or where would thorium be mined? And how is it mined? So, and then also, um, uh, what is the size of these these um, reactors? What would the size be? Sure. And are there actually any functioning... Uh, reactors like the ones you're talking about that are actually functioning. Three questions. So the thorium is, uh, you would never mine thorium by itself. You know, you'd never have a thorium mine. Thorium is a, right now, it's a it's a nuisance byproduct to uh, uh, usually what people would consider rare earth production, but you find it with uh, tailings in, in uh, iron mining and tin and gold. It, it generally, it's a, it's a mining byproduct. Right, so right now people would actually pay you to, to use <laughs> thorium for something. It's it's uh, it's less than cheap. It's and it's less than free. It's it's a, people would pay you to take take it off their hands. And uh, the uh, second question was uh, how big uh, would the uh, reactors be? The uh, if you want to look at the picture on the laptop, the uh, the original molten salt uh, reactor experiment. Uh, created 14 megawatts of power in a cylinder. You know, the main reactor chamber was about uh, six feet in diameter and about uh, about six feet tall. So it's very, very energy dense. Uh, that particular one used a carbon moderator, but almost every design, modern design of these molten salt reactors, do not use uh, carbon in their design. And uh, um, uh, and the, the as far as the working ones, the the, uh, the only one that's working today is uh, in China. The, the the several molten salt reactors that were built at Oak Ridge National Labs all worked back in the 60s, and uh, and then uh, Nixon shut them down in favor of the fast breeder reactor. And uh, that's a long story, but essentially they thought we were running out of uranium and plutonium, and so they wanted to build this thing called the fast breeder. It was it was uh, not uh, a very good strategic. All right, Ernie, Charles, uh, um, Ernie, and Don, pass me. Russell, Charles, and Don. Right. Okay. Coffee's <laughs> almost ready, Frank. Ernie? No, I'm pass. All right, Russ. Russell. Okay, y'all. Uh, how would you? Di what's your feeling on the uh, Westinghouse AP1000? You know, see, this is <laughs> this would be Andy's uh, ball of wax here, man. You know, because uh, I'm 
it's it's basically the way a reactor should have been made, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, what we did back in the, the old days was every single reactor was a one-off design, a one-off design, and, and that's why they were hard to manage and hard to... Back in the 90s, what happened is they standardized pumps and valves and things on reactors. That's why reactors went from having, like, ridiculously low 30% uptimes to now they have, like, 99% uptimes. But the solid fuel reactor, I mean, the AP-1000 is a very good solid fuel reactor, but, you know, you know, just between me, you, and the lamppost, I don't think, you know, big 1,400 megawatt, you know, reactors are the way to go anymore. I think more distributed energy or several smaller ones, you know, if you want to make 1,400 watts of, uh, megawatts of energy, well, probably seven 200 megawatt reactors might be the better way to do it. Because now, if, if a reactor has to go offline, that's 1,400 megawatts going offline. Whereas if you have seven 200 megawatt ones and one has to go offline for maintenance or something, it's you know it's a relatively small amount to handle. So, so that's that's all I have to say. I mean, it's it's a good design, but it's the kind of design we should have had 40 years ago. Well, at least it's shovel ready. Seven of those right. Charles, up two hundred million, or two million per. Mr. Beta. All right, uh, John. I I gave a lecture here on human evolution, and I believe you said that human beings have have evolved with some inherent yeah, all attribute. Animals. All animals and plants have uh, the ability to repair themselves. You're you're bombarded with it. You're, yeah, yeah. You're you right now. You yourself are bombarded. Everyone in this room is bombarded with two hundred thousand nuclear events a day. So your your cells are repairing that constantly. And yes, and without that, they've actually done experiments where if you actually do try and isolate somebody, and, you know, and and don't let them have any radiation exposure, your body gets a little flipped out by that. It needs. You know, it's just like it's just like some sunlight exposure. You need some. You just don't need a huge amount. You know, it's, we've you know we've learned that that a little is good. Lots of it can be kind of bad. Follow up. You you're maintaining that the dinosaurs in the Jurassic period lived in some sort of radioactive hot world. Oh, it was incredibly radioactive. I mean, if you if you understand the half life. You know, the concept of half-life? Think about it. Go back a hundred million years and think of how much more radioactive the world was back then. I mean, I'm showing you a, I'm showing you a base background radiation of 0.1 millisieverts per hour, right, on the, on the Geiger counter there. I, I bet the average background radiation back then was probably 20 millisieverts an hour or 100. It was, it was much, much more. Uh, and it would be like, it'd be like if every animal on the planet you know, uh, uh, was uh, flying around in a 747 at 35,000 feet. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, I'm just a little surprised because I've heard hey, Isn't that interesting? I mean, it blew my mind. That people died from exposure to radiation. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's fascinating, but, you know, we know that the, the idea of the half-life is true, and so the reasonable thing is go back, you know, to a time when... The, the natural uranium in the Earth's crust was uh, was over four percent. One YouTube. last follow-up. Why does sure. radon gas kill? Why does it kill? Uh, it's, it's the same thing as like smoking. Radon. You bring it into your lungs. The the tissue inside your lungs is particularly tender, and so when the radar, radon gas is right next to your cells, they're very. It's very energetic and very short range. And so it, it, it just causes a particularly large amount of damage to your cell. Uh, it's just like if you smoke, you know, you're getting polonium in your cigarettes. Now, polonium isn't particularly dangerous on your skin, but if you're like a Russian spy and someone shoots some polonium in you, you're going to die pretty quick. <laughs> so that's why, that's why uh, you know, anything you put in your lungs, any sort of particulate matter, isn't a very good idea. But if it happens to be spitting out you know, a little bit of radiation, and it's right on the cells. So we've not developed an immunity to naturally occurring gas in the Earth called radon. Well, 
I wouldn't say it's an immunity. I mean, you don't drop down dead of it. I mean, but the point is that when you have radon in greater quantities in Chicago than you do in, like, let's say, Alabama, then you're going to have a higher, you know, overall population incidence of lung diseases. Okay, Don Ruggie. Um, all right, well, question for John. And you, uh, I noticed here in, in this literature on the court that it says here that the first, the first molten salt, re okay, the, the first um, reactor using using the liquid fuel was built in 1952. Right. Uh, and now, and I noticed here, this is this is the literature from Dennis Nelson, uh, although he is not here. You know, it says here. This is, and I'm quoting, Thorium, the nuclear boondog was nowhere to be seen commercially. Now, you mentioned there's currently one, when you answered this lady's question, you said that there's currently one thorium reactor that is operational, and it's in China. Uh, and uh, yep. now, I'm, now, if the, the technology, now, so the technology for thorium reactors has existed for, for more than six years then, is that correct? From 1952 to the present. Yeah. Okay. Now, in all of that time, now we're, there are some 200 odd countries in the world. Uh, China, of course, is, and, and many of which have nuclear technology. And what I'm curious about is, in all of that time, why has why ha have thorium nuclear reactors not been developed more? Yeah. Well, so. The reason is that the supply chain that got put in place to develop solid fuel reactors uh, got a much bigger head start. Alvin Weinberg, the inventor of both the light water reactor and the molten salt reactor, uh, Alvin Weinberg said in a 1962 report, uh, and, and others uh, uh, said in a 1962 report to President Kennedy that uh, molten salt reactor should be the civilian reactor and thorium should be the civilian nuclear fuel uh, because uh, uranium and plutonium were seen back then as very precious and that they should have been reserved for military use only. So, but, you know, Westinghouse, GE, General Atomic, these guys invested billions and billions of dollars developing, you know, gaseous diffusion plants and d designs for their light water reactors and uh, in the 1950s, we were afraid that Russia was going to start giving away nuclear reactors to every country on the face of the planet. And so Eisenhower and the companies together just went, you know, hell-bent for leather to start putting reactors. It was the Adams for Peace program. And so just this became the nuclear technology to have. I mean, it was almost a fashion thing. And that's why, to this day, you know, the, the molten salt technology isn't even very well known by guys whose careers are spent operating solid fuel reactors or teachers that teach about uh, nuclear physics or radiochemistry. It's, it's uh, one of these things that, that uh, it was an unfortunate uh, uh, part of history where research in lots of reactors uh, went by the wayside. The lead bismuth reactor, the high temperature gas cooled reactor, the sodium reactor. I mean there are a lot of reactors out there that are much as safe and efficient as light water reactors are. The, the, these other reactors would have been even yet more safe and more efficient. So it's a, it's a big shame that we've had 30 years of essentially no R&D. This is about the United States and perhaps about about the uh, past, but what about Russia? I mean, the Russians do not. Have, the, the Russians did a. Developed. The Russians so did a great not. deal of work in thorium uh, thorium fuel. Right now, uh, Norway is getting prepared to sell uh, a solid thorium fuel rods for use in standard light water reactors. It's called MOX fuel, mixed oxide. Uh, the first commercial nuclear reactor ever. The shipping port reactor outside of Pittsburgh, uh, its last uh, fuel load was uh, thorium fuel, and uh, uh, the Russians, uh, I'll, I'll give you this, I don't need it, but the, the Russians clearly intend to build a thorium molten salt reactor. Uh, so the the thing is, you know, it was one of these, I'm telling you, it was, it, it was uh, uh, 
you know, the, the momentum of the industry worldwide was just, how do you run a reactor? You take uranium and you put it in solid rods and that's how you do it, you know? <laughs> so it was just unfortunate. Let me see. All right. You're talking to a special ed kid here. Uh, just the moment. Stuff. She, she, she oh, was first. Very good. Uh, I don't understand all your terms and everything. I'm very, uh, I said I'm almost special ed when it comes to understanding this. But I feel that you are, have been at a disadvantage here because you haven't been able to show in your multimedia presentation. Yeah. I saw the uh, television or the, uh, the tape on the, you know, on, in, in, it, was, it was done as a television show. And I, what I got from that was that the main reason we have so much nuclear waste and, and, and nuclear disaster uh, potential is not because of the materials as it is from the reactor itself that what we need to do is change the design of the reactor so that it produces safely and it has been it's, it's on the drawing board, it's been tested, and it has been proven, at least on a small scale, that uh, by changing the design of the reactor, we can make nuclear power <coughs> safe, and we can uh, go on to have a cheap source of energy and basically save the world by rocks rather than coal and all these other things and oil. And one of the reasons that we, we haven't seen this developed is because there has been such a paranoia about re the, the disasters that can be caused from nuclear power, but that's due to the reactors because the reactors were built, the reactors we have now are basically built for wartime, for bombs. All the questions. Not what is the question, the lady? Is that Can true? I I... Yes. You just need to lose your time. That's all. No, that's uh, that's that's true. Thank. I mean, yeah. I mean, you've been listening and you saw some good stuff. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly right. We we built in the '50s solid fuel reactors because we were. They're very robust and, and they're very effective, but it started out as submarine propulsion device and we essentially turned it into a commercial civilian reactor and that probably, you know, was not the right way to go. Another I'm ready, thing. You're ready with your question. I'm ready now. I remembered my question, which I forgot the last time. Okay. <laughs> Two quickies. Uh, you seem to indicate <laughs> that uh, one of the problems with wind. To me? Yes. Uh, is the fact that we'd have to be buying things from other countries, including China. Now, my understanding is, is uh, most of the rare earths are in China. If thorium is a byproduct of that, uh, isn't that a problem? That's number one. Number two, could you elaborate a little more on why the country went a different way uh, way back when uh, to, and it was having to do with nuclear weapons? Uh, wait, the country with which? United States? US. Yes. Yep. So can you restate that last part? All right, the last thing? part is you indicated that they, they built some of these molten salt reactors I yes. way back when, yep. but they went with the breeder reactor instead. Uh, I think, did you no, say but uh, it's a... Well, eventually they did. Yes. yes. Uh, well, I'd like to understand why that is. If this is such a good concept, why didn't they go with this concept? <laughs> well, uh, the, the first thing I'll answer real as quickly as I possibly can so China gets most of its uh, 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 rare earth elements that they sell uh, from, a, from a very unique type of, uh, of formation called ionic clays. And the ionic clays have very, very little thorium in them. But China has grown so much that whereas they used to produce three times more rare earth than the world needs, now they're actually at the point where they're about to be able to use all the domestic produced rare earths, meaning that the, 
the whole rest of the world won't be able to get rare earths because China will legitimately need all the rare earths. You may go and look, uh, there's a WTO uh, lawsuit right now that uh, Obama uh, brought against China last year uh, pertaining to this. Uh, uh, anywho, sorry, I digress. So most of China's rare earths don't produce very much thorium. But because they need so much rare earths now, they're starting to import minerals like monazite and bastazite and apatite and xenotime. You know, they're bringing their stuff in from Australia, even the United States. Whereas we used to produce rare earths, now we're sending our ore to China. And we don't get it back, <laughs> which is sad. Uh, as for the, the direction, what happened, um, you know, you can always debate this, but there's a lot of us that feel that what happened was with the, the light water reactor, they saw it as a win-win. They actually liked that the light water reactor made a lot of, uh, a lot of plutonium because they, they said, hey man, you get energy and stuff for bombs. And you got to remember, there was a time when we were making like 6,000 bombs a year. We needed a lot of plutonium back then. And, uh, uh, and, and so then further on than that, you get to the breeder reactor, which is different than your standard light water reactor. The, the breeder reactor was supposed to even be, you know, the thought was it would be even yet better. It would just make huge amounts of plutonium and it would just produce its own fuel so you'd never have to add fuel to it. It would actually produce net fuel. One of the freaky things about how nuclear reactors work, you can actually get more fuel out than you put in. But uh, by 1980, even Ronald Reagan knew that the breeder was not going to work. And so, and so that led us into the woods of no real reactor development for almost 30 years. Uh, let's see. Uh, he, he was first. Mark, all right. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Question for both of you. Can you give some idea of the relative cost of these approaches to generating energy? How much does it cost from capital cost for a one megawatt sure. thorium thing and compared to what it costs the same capability with solar? That is a, a megawatt year per year <coughs> capability to reflect sure. the fact that the solar is partially available. Yeah. Uh, as far as, as I can tell from the cost, uh, you know, uh, seven of the small modular units that John's talking about would be almost the equivalent of one big, you know, uh, 1,200 megawatt, uh, 1,400 megawatt nuclear plant divided up into 200 megawatts apiece at $400 million each. It's like... 2.8 billion, uh, figure a little cost overrun, figure three billion dollars for seven of these small ones, com maybe, uh, c roughly compared to a uh, billion dollars spent on wind and solar that would give you roughly the same output. Wind and solar are cheaper uh, in total output and, uh, and the cost is coming down. Uh, you know, kilowatt per kilowatt wind machines today are vastly cheaper than nuclear power installed. But he's right in saying that they don't run all the time. Uh, the well, problem. I'm just talking about the, the average over a year. The over average o over a year. I think uh, most countries in the world, if you look at the studies, they will generally agree that if, uh, to get, you know. 50 megawatts worth of, you know, or 1,400, 1,500, 2,000 megawatts worth of power, it'll go up in a quarter of the time for about half the cost if you go wind. Uh, the nuclear power will cost at least double what wind installed wind capacity costs, and the wind machines are smaller and modular, and there's going to be more of them spread out over a wider area. You're giving me a bunch of detail that I didn't ask for. Okay, Something that generates a megawatt year of energy. I don't know what the actual megawatt year it's cost. You know, they have that in the files, but in, in round numbers, yes, wind power per megawatt year is cheaper than a megawatt year of nuclear. There's no question about that. And uh, without the subsidies, you know, uh, wind is not subsidized like nuclear is. If they if they're on a level playing field, uh, nobody is going to be building nuclear power plants if you take away the subsidies. Do you agree so, with that, 
Uh, it won't surprise me that I don't agree with that. The, uh, if, if, uh, if you guys are up to it, you can look at the uh, a really fine assessment per exactly what you're asking for per kilowatt hour of, of generated power. <clears throat> and uh, molten, you know, coal. To give you an idea, to compare a few things, coal is about 1.8 cents per kilowatt hour power generated. Molten salt reactor is probably about two cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, solar and wind, wind is probably 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Solar is still hovering into the 18 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And we're not even going into the discussions of the intermittent or diffuse nature of it. Are you it. including in that the initial capital cost? In yeah, CapEx is included in that, sure. So right. you're saying that solar's <clears throat> that's day? all in. That's 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 a kilowatt delivered to the door. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. and, 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 the, and the guy's name is Dr. Robert Hargraves. For those of you, uh, just uh, uh, just about uh, the finest uh, summary of of comparing apples to apples, kilowatt delivered to the door cost. All right, Karina. Andy, um, how would you address the future energy? wants of China and India, do you think that you can provide enough energy uh, for the people of China and India using solar and wind? Uh, the, the question for those of you who didn't hear it, how, how would you address the future energy needs of China uh, and India? I would encourage them to go with the least cost energy strategy first. That is, uh, spend spend money first on ultra-efficient lights, motors, computers, everything else, and the amount of energy that the country needs goes down drastically. And when um, you get the most bang for the buck on energy needs with the least cost strategy the Rocky Mountain Institute and others have been uh, talking about for 30 years, like the houses without furnaces. The houses without furnaces cost the same as a house with a furnace that uses $100 worth of month in energy. So there's, uh, and in fact, many builders say it costs a little less to make a house that way. Well, that's the way it is with big chemical plants and in industry and all kinds of things. If you uh, you could downsize a chemical plant with it where there was a 100 horsepower motor, make the pipes bigger and redesign it a little bit, and you get by with a 7 horsepower motor. You drop the energy consumption and from industry, a lot of industrial things can be dropped 80 or 90 percent with the new technologies that have been widely available. And so this is not generally well understood. That countries do not need to keep thinking they're going to be needing more and more and more energy um, if they go if they, with a blend of the latest high efficiency technologies that are way cheaper than energy sources. It's called the megawatt revolution. Go toward efficiency first and after that you can, uh, you can run a country uh, with a blend of renewables, some biofuel, some natural gas, uh, a lot of solar and wind. Okay? Is that yeah. Thank you. All right, Brown, we got one here. Okay, uh, John. John, back, back to the developed countries. Uh, that's a different story than the underdeveloped or developing countries. Uh, you briefly mentioned Germany. How familiar you are with Germany as far as production, consumption, lifestyle, to have, looks like you have brushed off their um, decreased use of nuclear energy uh, and yet being very, very productive and very prosperous. Uh, blaming them for exploitation of third world workers in China. Can you see some other factors that uh, can explain their success other than exploiting the Chinese? For Germany? Yeah. Yeah, because Germany closed its 17 nuclear power plants and now buys nuclear power from France and Czechoslovakia. Oh, that's you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, that is. So, so, I mean, that's all they did was transfer the nuclear power load onto their neighboring countries. And, and one of the, one of the, the things is that, that people don't uh, know about is that Germany, in order to talk about, uh, talk about subsidized energy, 
Germany actually pays France to take its its excess wind energy. People are like, look, Germany's making excess wind energy. It's like, yeah, they're making it at night when it's not needed, and so they're shunting it off to France. France loves it. You know what France is doing with all that energy? They're boiling water. Not for any purpose, not to like sterilize, you know, test tubes or clean clothes. They're just boiling water as a resistance method of getting rid of energy. Because Germany pays them. Why the hell not? You know? I mean, Germany shut down their 17 reactors, and now they're they're relying on power from France and and uh, Czechoslovakia mainly for their nuclear. Okay, Can I why, ask one one other thing that? But why that, would they what, do that? Hold on one second. What I uh, that last answer, by the way, Andy, efficiency works where it already exists. But if you bring one billion new people online, it doesn't unless they're a hundred percent efficient and somehow make their own power you know, through their skin, it doesn't matter how efficient they are, that's one billion new people using X amount of energy. And X amount of energy times a billion people is gonna be, require huge new sources of energy, and that's just not gonna be satisfied by diffuse, intermittent, very costly, highly subsidized wind and solar. I'm sorry, and so you had a follow-up there? No, I, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Why would they... Uh, they're successful and they they're know they're not successful. I, you know, you got to get the... Germany is not successful with their energy balance. They are... Their energy balance is completely out of whack. They make energy when they can't use it at night, so they wind up selling it to, to France by paying France to take it. And during the day when BMW and Siemens and Bosch need energy, they need to tap their neighbors, France and Czechoslovakia, uh, to get the power to run their, their plants. I mean, it's they in Germany, where does Germany get its natural gas? Putin, Vladimir Putin, is that who you want to rely on for all your natural gas? Believe me, Germany uses vast amounts of natural gas and Germany is using more coal than it has in 20 years. How do you think they're they're making up the loss of 17 nuclear reactors? They're digging the filthiest, brownest German crap coal out of the ground at a rate like they haven't done in almost a generation and burning it. So Germany is not a success. They're an abject failure and it's a lie that anything that Germany is doing has to do with renewable energy. It's, it's a sham and the Germans are suckers you know, for putting up with it. Somebody's got to call uh, the truth squad out on, on yeah. Germany. All right, this guy's been asking for, for a question for some time. All right. <clears throat> I came in a little late, so I didn't want to hear your presentation, but um, one thing I did caught a catch was this question you had of the whole question of radiation, the, um, the kind of naive notion that people today have about radiation. In fact, we had the whole biosphere is, is a changing mechanism. We change from uh, carbon dioxide to a whole oxygen. I mean, the extinction of various uh, items in that change are phenomenal. The question I, because it, it transformed the whole biosphere, as I've got the indication you were presenting. The thing I wanted to get at is this question of energy flux density. That if you look at mankind burning wood and then moving to oil and moving to gas, there's different densities in the amount of fire and the kind of fire that man uses. When we went to oil, we went to thermonuclear or fission and now fusion. So in looking at that energy density question, how do we have to go to higher and higher orders? First, from your presentation, I understand you see that the blocking of nuclear and all this is totally stymied the earth and mankind to be able to deal with this. But secondly, we, I just picked up on what you just said, that we have to immediately go back to these kinds of technologies, breaking some of these fears and phobias, if we're going to have the energy density to do what we have to do. Yeah. And uh, we've got some major problems in terms of the, the total amount of energy that we need in terms of density, but also things like asteroids and whatever, getting the force fields to actually deal with those. So the is question is going backwards is how. Oh. So is that your question? You know, how do we deal with energy densities? Well, needed? the question that we've got to go forward to higher and higher densities as opposed to somehow, like you were mentioning on the Germans, that you can go backwards and patch it up. There's no such we got to advance. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that uh, Andy is absolutely right about is that we in the West, the cheapest thing we could do is become more efficient. Uh, but, but one of the last conversations I had with Amory Lovins, if you know who this guy is, 
When we were at Enbro, I had a chance to talk to him. He's at the Rocky Mountain Institute. And, you know, he was kind of a hero of mine when he was younger, but you know, he he's, keeps falling down pegs on me. And when I spoke to, to Amory, I said, hey, look, um, you know, you, you're uh, about wanting to, you know, have a more prosperous future. Don't you think you should at least consider this, you know, this molten salt reactor technology? It's the densest, cleanest, you know, the whole shoot match. It's the densest form of energy we have on this planet. And, and he said, and I thought this was so incredibly cynical of him. You know, he said, he said, well, if we make vast amounts of clean, safe energy, people will just waste it. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, I mean, you're probably right, Amory, but if we solve the energy problem, it's not exactly like we don't have a million other problems to solve. You know, overpopulation, animal extinction, literacy. I mean, just there's a million bajillion problems we need to solve. Solving the energy problem. I, I thought it was such a cynical, self-serving thing to say. Oh, yeah, if we make lots of cheap, clean energy, people will just waste it. He wants privation. He wants shortages. <laughs> One quick follow-up. There's a classic study, you take the energy question and looking at transportation. Major contest going on, the Earth Day types, they've got solar collector cars and whatever. One guy comes up and asks if he can join and actually participate in the contest that they were having to see who could do the thing the most cheaply. So he signs up, they say, where's your vehicle? He says, it's around the corner. I'll bring it, he says, bring it up. So he drives this um, huge concrete mixer truck up to this uh, particular hey, test. You know, it's, it's not a question. Yeah, I'm yeah, just saying, he, dri he wins the contest because it's the amount of work that you do, not energy. All right. What is the efficiency of the work? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's Very good. Uh, rebuttal period is to begin. Yeah. I wonder how many people have. Remarks to make to the rest of us, or questions to raise. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, at least thirteen, fourteen. Okay. Twenty minutes each. Ha ha ha. Twenty seconds. Four minutes each. Okay. Uh, four minutes each. Jim is keeping the time. Four minutes. All right. Try to keep it a less. All right, four minutes, what I'm going to do with the lights. You'll get a green light at three minutes, a yellow light at three and a half minutes, and a red light at four. All right, let's thank our speakers, our debaters. All right, let's rock and roll, boys. All right, come back up there, Jen. Joe Mayer. All right. Thank you, Bob. By Neil Rasmus and uh, Frank Aguilar. Ready, set, go. Uh, I was watching television the other night and the commercial for Celebrex came on. And it was an ordinary commercial, nice people walking around. And uh, they were telling you how good Celebrex was. And then things got more active on screen. They were doing things that draw your interest. And in the process of doing that, they were telling me all of the things that were wrong with celebrates. Causes death, causes cancer, <coughs> all, all kinds of things. And then when all of that merged into a, a peaceful scene again, they were telling you, ask your doctor whether Celebrex is right for you. I feel that John Hooch is doing the same thing to us. By the way he presents giving you a heart up. By the way he presents Celebrex is not a uh, Oh no, it's that one of those. Not one of those. He's, he, he's giving us a lot of diversion and not dealing with the with the real questions. And some of the questions are obvious, of course. The amount of uh, he mislabels, the, the, he calls it the uh, uh, thorium salt reactor, when actually it's the liquid fluoride salt, molten salt reactor, which is very dated. It produces very corrosive chemicals, and they have not solved the problem of what to do with these corrosive chemicals. They, they're there, and they're going to eat away at all of the containment vessels that uh, uh, they use to produce 
the uh, electricity, the, the energy, um, the rare earths, the greatest reserves of rare earths is not in China, it's in the United States, and it's a byproduct of mining, that John said, uh, when they mine uranium, for example, uh, much of the uh, waste products is rare, is rare earths, but we don't have the need to produce facilities to process them into individual rare earths at this point, whereas China does. We send some of our uh, mining surplus to China, and they, they have the facilities for those. We don't do it yet. We will, as soon as China reaches that level. Um, the the, the, uh, the, the so-called clean uh, wind and solar energy uh, power is, John said, was about 5% of our energy needs, uh, when in fact, solar by itself, the solar cell used to be 12% efficient. That was really good. But with the use of quantum dot technology now, that uses the entire solar spectrum to produce the electrons and the voltage, uh, we're running at about 35% efficiency. That is very good. It, it, it'll be commercially available probably within the next five years or so. How long will it take? How long will it take to knock down the screen? <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. It's accident free. <laughs> How long will it take to produce commercially available um, thorium reactors, not thorium reactors, excuse me, liquid fluoride molten salt reactors? Uh, it will take about 40 to 50 years to develop the, the technology to deal with all of the problems. Uh, and I mentioned one of them before, and one of them is the yellow light is on. The, uh, the, the, the uh, problem with thorium is my, my time is up and I won't leave. You are the actionary, you know. Hi. Do you want to get extra time? Well, uh, as, as you know me, uh, people who do know me, they call me Plastic Shed Frank in here. Uh, I think it's a well-deserved uh, moniker. Uh, I'm proud of it. And also, if you don't know me by that uh, uh, proclivity of mine, I like to study the process of nuclear uh, nuclear physics. Um, when I first came to the States, I came with the illusion of becoming a nuclear physicist. Uh, my language was so bad that the university told me, you're kidding, you have to start studying English first. And that was a bigger mountain for me than studying physics or mathematics. Uh, so that's another story. Um, what I think that uh, we have to know, we have to understand why are we concerned about the spread of these radioactive materials into the environment, the biosphere that we live. Uh, when uh, the speaker mentioned about the natural occurring radiation, this radiation that naturally uh, is emitted from the the, the rocks and all the materials, they are in the mixture of the earth. But when we're talking about the radioactive materials created in a nuclear power plant, and then they, are, they have to be uh, disposed, manipulated, and so on, they become particles or gases that you inhale in your body. So that's not outside radiation. That is radiation that become part of particles that they are radioactive, decayed millions of times, sometimes a second, inside your body. And where the distance between uh, radiation that coming outside of your body to your body is, is just uh, a great distance. When you have a particle radiating inside your, your, your lung or something, the distance is zero. It's right there. And every every bit of that energy 
in the radiation emitted is absorbed by your cells around that particle. And that, very soon, if you, if you continue bombarding the cells in a way that damages them, eventually they couldn't fix themselves and become uh, damaged cells, could be cancerous or could die. Many of the cells die when they are attacked that way, but some escape death and become cancerous. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the industry, the nuclear industry, tries to uh, distract you with the idea that, yeah, radiation is always here and so on. Yeah, we understand that. But we know, as a fact, that wherever these plants have leaked radiation, the normal development of uh, fetuses and uh, the incidence of different uh, thyroid cancers and other cancers have increased. And the same happened here after Three Mile Island, and it happened downwind from some nuclear power plants. So we have to really understand the differences and, uh, and the implications of all these radioactive uh, waste that we are creating. And uh, these this, uh, molten salt reactors, uh, it reminds me of, uh, you know, they are safe. There is no problem if the reaction goes uh, too hot, we dump the thing into a tank. But if there is a leakage of these uh, molten salts and containing uh, or and in contact with the, with the air, you have fires. Now, um, another, uh, as an engineer, I can tell you that we have never tested any material at 900 degrees into a salt for 10 years. We don't have that, and these reactors didn't have that. Okay, Manzisco. Uh, before I, I critique the question, which I think was wrong, uh, I want to quickly critique the, the so-called debate, which was remarkably fact-free. 60-year-old um, advertising slogans and 40-year-old debunkings are not terribly relevant. Um, does anybody here actually know what a sievert is? Yes. Does anybody, yeah, with, with one exception, does anybody know how many sieverts there have to be before you have something to worry about? Yes, there's a, a, a eight micro sieverts in a banana, peachy, but, but how, how many sieverts actually does it take before you have to care about it? You, you left it order, out. You can download this. You left chart. it out, though. <laughs> My point is that you were not actually informative. I do have one specific factual correction. Uh, I was one of the people who believed the, the I guess, urban myth of the moment that Germany is importing nuclear power from France. So I did some research uh, real fast. Impacts of Germany's nuclear phase-out on electricity imports and exports report commissioned by Greenpeace Germany, 31st January 2013. Now I take it for granted that there's a variety, there's a range of opinions here about Greenpeace. Does anybody think that Greenpeace is going to be extra generous to the nuclear industry? No, okay. And Greenpeace says actually Germany is a net electricity exporter even with the nuclear shutdown. So I was mistaken. They pay countries to take it. The yeah, yeah, yeah. That's your, topic your of the answer, in my opinion, is wrong. There isn't one answer. For the first century, the Industrial Revolution ran on coal. And for a century and a half, it's run on a mix of coal and petroleum. Well, there's a whole lot of reasons we can't do that anymore. And we're not going to go to any other single source. We are going to go to a increasingly broad mix of energy sources. I'm all for solar, I'm all for wind, but the electric grid goes where the people are. The windmills are going to go where people are not, which means we have to, in effect, 
build an entire new national set of electric grids at least the size of the one that we're using now for however many generations we've been accumulating it. The gasoline cars days are numbered. Uh, something I've looked up is there are moderate estimate 150,000 gas stations in the country. I'm not sure what cars are going to run on, but replacing 150,000 gas stations and the entire supply infrastructure behind them is what we call non-trivial. Uh, I'm a great fan of Stuart Brand, as I, I may have mentioned from time to time, and he recently reversed some of his opinions and a wonderful epigram, he says, I'm not pro-nuke, I'm pro-arithmetic. On a time scale of one to two generations, there seems to be no alternative. Somebody talked about how many Americans would be killed by a Chernobyl every year. Well, right now, 30,000 Americans are killed by the smoke from coal-powered electrical plants every year. That's several Chernobyls. Mix is what we're stuck with. That, that mix. That mix. No. Thorium nuclear thorium molten salt. Mmm. Makes me want to eat some salty popcorn. When they were building the railroads in this country and they had to tunnel through the mountains, they took a group of Chinese, they gave them dynamite and told them to go in and plant the dynamite. Oftentimes the dynamite went off and blew up the whole gang of Chinamen. And the people that were building the tunnels were faced with the problem of getting some more Chinamen. Well, if every time I start my car, uh, because that my starter is causing Chinamen to die, then let them die. I say that, you know, we Americans should live good, live big, and don't worry about China. Let China take care of themselves. What's more, I say buy stock in Commonwealth Edison because that this thorium stuff and all this other stuff mostly isn't even going to prevail. Thank you. Well, I guess if um, people remember their history, the uh, New York Times ran banner headlines how horses and people would die from electrical lines. And we have um, scores of uh, items like this where people faced with new ideas panic. Now these ideas on nuclear and nuclear fission actually go back to people like Einstein and um, the question here is in, in Mont's box plank. So the theories and the actual physics of this have been around for like a hundred years. The problem is we've been led down a number of roads where we haven't even applied that. So the question earlier about what about the energy development of an India or a China? Well, what about it? We just had one example saying, kill them off, we're going. Nobody's going to go forward unless we actually get to a higher energy density like I to try to ask in the question. So what's the highest energy density we have immediately on the future is a transition from fission into thermonuclear fusion. It's not just about energy, it's about what you can do with the energy. So you take something, maybe people have heard about it, like a plasma torch, where you've got the concentrated energy to take a cubic mile of rock and start taking all the elements and materials out of it. 
So you start looking at various concentrations like we did with iron ore and things like this. We got the big deposits. Well, where is the most com concentrated density of these products that we basically process? Well, we go to the man-made landfills and reprocess all that. So all this nonsense that we get into, that we got to go this, we got to go this, we get stampeded by fears, and we set ourselves up to be wrecked. And with the financial blowout right now and the idiots we have running it on many of the governments falling for this green nonsense, and especially Obama, who's a total product of that, we are either going to a thermonuclear war or we're going to a thermonuclear fusion future. And that is presently on the table. It's being fought out in this war if it gets started. So the question here is how do we deal with our own fears about thinking? And if you look at the energy density of how the earth is built, the biosphere, then mankind, the application and the use of different levels of fire, it's only on that increased energy density that has allowed this to develop. And people can shake their heads and get all bent out of shape, and it really doesn't mean anything because we're either going to build the capability as a human race to be able to knock these asteroids off course, or one of them will kill the whole species if we don't kill ourselves first. So if people went back around on this, they can go to the LaRouche Pack site and pick it up. He's been laying this out for years. Everybody here knows it. There's questions we can actually solve these problems. From big water projects, water out of Alaska, we can do this, but you're not going to do it without a shift in nuclear power. So stop the fears, do a little work, and I commend, uh, I didn't get your name, but John. Very good. But you got to shake yourself up a little bit. Start thinking or you're going to lose everything you got. See? We laugh when we can't think. First, uh, I want to pick a little bone with both speakers on some numbers. We're, we had a lot of numbers thrown around. Um, John said wind has no more than a 5% uptime or something to that effect. That's not the figure I've heard. Okay, I've heard that the figure in Europe is 30% and in the United States is a little higher at 35%. Uh, I, you know, I haven't been out there timing it myself, so I don't know, but I, they were reliable sources, uh, as I remember at the time. Uh, you said no deaths in the nuclear industry. <laughs> at least there were some deaths, uh, I believe back in the late 50s, there was a problem at a, uh, uh, a location in Idaho where three people were killed, and, and there, have been lots, there were lots of people that died because of Chernobyl and probably a bunch because of Fukushima. Now, I don't know what kind of deaths we've had in, in this country, in Three Mile Island, where there are no deaths at all. I'm skeptical. Uh, maybe less deaths, although I want to pick a bone here with Neil. He said 30,000 people die due to coal uh, inhalation of the, of the smoke. That number sounds high to me. Perhaps you have a source. Uh, and I know there are a lot of people who die from that. And, and from natural gas, I've heard the figure 400 people a year die because of explosions and so on. There's, there's deaths associated, associated with all energy uh, sources. Uh, Andy said a few yards of solar cells can heat or supply energy to an entire home. Uh, I hadn't heard that before. That sounds a little optimistic, especially if it were in a place like Chicago. And I would like to know what the dollar cost of the initial uh, investment there is. Uh, as far as getting to uh, renewables, uh, right now a lot of people are surprised to hear that Iowa is the most wind, uh, uses, uh, has the highest percentage of their energy furnished by wind uh, at this point, and that's 20 percent. Uh, the whole country doesn't have a goal to get there until uh, 2030, and Europe is planning on getting by 2020 to some, somewhat larger than that. Whether they'll succeed or not, whether they'll succeed or not, we, we shall see. And one of the problems with electricity is it does not travel well. As it goes down those lines, you you lose a lot of the power. Uh, and I don't know what the exact numbers are. I read a number a few years ago. That, that what you get out of that electrical outlet in your wall is only 38% of what's put in at the power plant on an average. Uh, there may be updated figures on that, but it doesn't travel well. Now that speaks well for both renewables, because most renewables are somewhat local, 
okay, your wind towers and your solar on your own roof, they, the electricity doesn't have to go very far. Uh, so that speaks well to both sides of the argument. Um, but, uh, you know, electricity doesn't travel well, that's a big problem with these huge plants and the electricity has to go a great distance. Uh, it strikes me that one of the better sources, which we don't hear much about, is tidal. There's just huge, huge, huge amounts of energy generated by water moving all around the world. And uh, the Brits are doing some work in this, uh, the Swedes are, and there may be some other people. We'll see what they come up with. I think the, the capital costs, the initial capital costs are very high, but, you, but once you get them in there, the, the flows are dependable, unlike wind, which goes and stops and goes and stops. The, the, those keep going uh, on and on. Uh, and 80% of the world lives within uh, 100 miles of, of uh, the ocean, so there's not too much distance that, they, that uh, the energy would have to travel. Uh, the biggest uh, way to help, which both uh, of our speakers agreed, is reduce consumption. Be more efficient, reduce the consumption. But the most important single way uh, to, to help here is reduce population. The world cannot uh, sustain the population that we have if the people, even a fraction of them, become middle class. Uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, this is the most important way and uh, however by far the most difficult to implement politically and socially. So we'll have to see what happens. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Le Ping Yuan. Uh, thanks to the speakers. Uh, very good information uh, for both of them. Uh, I just like to say one thing: the energy problem is a world problem. Uh, I just hope to remove the politics out of that, because uh, I was a geologist when I moved to the United States in 1980. The oil, because of the oil crisis, and uh, the oil price is very high. I study geology, and uh, everybody say, once you graduate, you can get a high-paid. Uh, 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 job from oil company, usually they got uh, 10 or so uh, offers and uh, you just uh, sit there and uh, pick one of them. Uh, when I graduate, uh, uh, thousands of people got laid off, geologists got laid off uh, from oil company. And, uh, and the, the, the Middle East, uh, I can imagine the, the oil industry over there is in very bad shape because uh, they try to, what they tried uh, to punish U.S. for several years in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, then the oil price got <coughs> dropped like a rock. So the uh, whole oil co uh, industry was uh, almost dead for, for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, I was uh, fortunately uh, got a job for 10 years, and, but the oil industry was was uh, very in very bad shape, so I changed my field. But uh, two years after I changed, the oil price went up. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, this is uh, just uh, the, the the politics cannot go against market. Market force is so powerful than everything else. Uh, politics or military and uh, so what we we heard about oh we need energy independent we want to explore more oil from the United States uh, to be self-efficient sufficient that's just a uh, yes <laughs> the oil and the gas those are natural resources it's limited of quantity you explore more, your grandson and grandchildren will have less to use. So they will have more dependencies on foreign countries. And uh, for example, another current problem is, uh, we have said that uh, oil is imported as a big threat to the US security, whatever. But now suddenly the same people say, we got more gas to export, we should export more gas. So we don't have any energy dependency issue, we can export gas. 
I think those are all people wants to make money and they, they put that. Uh, so politics is should be out of energy problem and uh, we should uh, have uh, a logo uh, say, uh, say energy without borders. Thank you. Uh, before I forget, I'd like to recognize our friend uh, Brown Basford here. Uh, we just had a, recently a celebration of uh, Martin Luther King's uh, uh, 50th anniversary of his uh, I Have a Dream speech, and uh, we must remember that you were part of the Freedom Riders, and uh, I want to acknowledge that. And, uh, You you did you did uh, more than enough for a lifetime. Thanks, thanks for, from my heart. Um, um, when I was um, uh, in, in the early 1980s, uh, I was a member of the Citizens Party, and uh, uh, Barry Commoner was our presidential candidate in, in 1980, and uh, um, so I was very uh, anti-nuke at that time, but. Um, um, I was educated as a physicist, um, got my uh, degree from the Illinois Institute of Technology and Physics. Uh, I didn't study nuclear physics per se, uh, there's a whole different set of equations uh, and uh, things uh, uh, with uh, neutron capture cross sections and things like that uh, that I didn't study in a technical manner. Uh, to fully understand everything to do with this uh, thorium uh, liquid fluoride um, as the uh, um, solvent, as I understand it, uh, the thorium goes into and it's a part of a um, combination and there is there are all these technical difficulties with it you'd have to be really um, an expert uh, I think John knows a good bit about it uh, from what he's been explaining but um, no, none of us here know all the technical difficulties uh, some of them were brought up uh, by uh, Joe Meyer um, if we had just had some more experience with long-running uh, thorium type reactors, uh, we would have more data to go by. Um, the question we have is that we have a problem with global warming um, due to uh, the fact that we're burning natural gas to generate our electricity and the fracking that we're doing in order to get this natural gas, which is cheap because of these new processes that are very destructive to our environment, uh, that's killing us. Uh, in a different way, and uh, a thorium, thorium reactors haven't killed anyone yet, but uh, uh, the global warming that's uh, uh, coming because of this natural gas, of course, is actual, actually methane, and there's a tremendous amount of leakage when they, uh, when they use fracking to get it, and it's a worse, um, it's a worse uh, greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide, so uh, it's, uh, it's a terrible problem because we can't just suddenly, we, we should become more efficient. We are actually doing that, but not fast enough, and we do have too large a population, but unless we wipe them out, uh, Syria is trying to do that, but uh, uh, not too many other countries are trying to wipe out a population quickly uh, enough to solve the global warming problem, <laughs> and we don't really want to do it that way. But um, as a bridge towards uh, that, um, these thorium uh, type reactors are a possibility. Um, certainly uh, they do appear to be safer uh, than the reactors that we've been using, um, the solid fuel reactors, and um, the um, ability to get the uh, fissile products out um, is a little easier, as I understand technically. However, those problems aren't completely solved, and the graphite that's used as containment um, can get corroded. Uh, so uh, these are problems which um, I think should be studied and we should get a better appreciation of um, the possibility of using uh, thorium reactors as bridges. Um, certainly it looks like they might be better alternative than the fracking of natural gas, which is what's being done now uh, by our industry. So um, I haven't thought of everything that I meant to say, but uh, I think I probably just about used up the four minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right. Now I have to admit. Now I am not an expert on nuclear physics. I know there's a lot of people here tonight who are, or who know a lot about about engineering, but I am not one of them. 
but I uh, our our speaker tonight, who spoke in favor of uh, thorium-powered molten salt reactors, seemed to downplay the danger <coughs> from. Um, okay, I'm getting a signal from Frank to talk more directly into the microphone. Anyway, our speaker um, tonight, John uh, Kutch, uh, seemed to downplay or try to minimize the danger from a nuclear um, a disaster like Fukushima. And I, you know, and I don't know what to say to that. I mean, I mean, if you say something like Chernobyl, or Fukushima, oh, it's no problem. I mean, I don't know how to respond to that. What? You know, having a having a major nuclear meltdown and you know, potentially, you know, all the destruct all the destruction and people killed, that, that's nothing. I mean, um, and 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 I also noticed that I thought we were talking about a different form of nuclear energy, but our speaker's using a lot of the same arguments to defend thorium as have already been used to defend regular old old-fashioned nuclear power so i don't quite understand that uh, now there's and another thing that's never really that i've never really understood is why we don't have if, if this thorium thing is 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 so great and so efficient why after 60 years we don't have more of it I mean, you think with all the different people with nuclear power, somebody would develop more. And that, this is something that's not really been explained to me. And finally, this idea that nuclear power is safer than solar, and, and, and also the argument that people getting, you know, the people getting killed is inevitable. I heard our speaker kind of, uh, I heard John say that tonight. And I have to say that that sounds real great. Oh, we all know, big deal. Everybody gets killed once in a while. So what? Yeah, that's great unless you're one of the people. <laughs> all right. Let me fix this. This is good. Oh, All right. Let's see here. Uh, let's begin by thanking again both of our. Very knowledgeable debaters and Jim for helping it out with this equipment. And gentlemen, let's continue keep it until after the rebuttal period. Neil? Probably. Neil? Probably, probably just, me. I've never killed him. Sir, all right. Let's, let's, uh. Look, I'm getting. Rom, well, you're supposed to be the moderator. All right. This guy's giving me shit. I'm to moderate you. Yeah, well, this guy was giving me shit. And I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, all right, right, it's over with. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. I'm going to give you both their time. Yeah, no, no, you know better than to get up in the middle of my rebuttal, interrupting my rebuttal. <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to do that. If you interrupt this, that's Two fine. Two minutes, Charlie. <laughs> you got actually about uh, three well, more minutes. Charlie. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we thanked everybody, so we're happy again. Um, the only thing I'm going to come after you, John, there are zero operator deaths in the nuclear industry. Are you talking about, I guess, the guys who sit in the control room and spin some dials and things of that nature? Now, my information as a union official is somewhat dated. <laughs> But I vaguely recollect that what the nuclear industry was doing, you need people to maintain these reactors, and they use plumbing and things of that nature. They would hire contract employees, uh, basically hillbillies with drinking problems. <laughs> Give them enormous amounts of money for about a 10 minute exposure, uh, which was the equivalent, this is very serious though, the equivalent of about 150 x-rays. And technically they were not permitted to work again for a certain period of time, but they would go to another reactor 
and the people at that facility didn't check or there was no method and so they would get another dose of 150 things. This is what the nuclear industry was apparently engaged in. Uh, you brought up the fact that somewhere I heard there's temperatures of 9,000 degrees and corrosive salts. These things most assuredly are going to require someone to go in there to work on this device. And this is, we're not talking about the water heater in my basement. I mean, um, so the other thing I was thinking was, I actually toured a solar power panel factory in Bridgeport, my neighborhood, and I didn't feel endangered in any fashion. However, if someone announced that they were going to put in a nuclear reactor, I think the Bridgeport Community Council might have some issues with this. Um, the other thing I'm looking at it from a green is, what system produces, is it producing pollution? And I read in here that, according to Andy, I don't know what pollution comes out of the solar or wind, but I do read that the thorium stuff produces something that very, don't be too concerned, it's benign after 350 years. And I don't think that's what the stuff in the photo the guy is holding, this benign stuff, I don't know. But the essence of it, if you're still producing pollution, what are we achieving? Nuclear reactors produce the purest and most deadliest form of pollution that we've ever designed. Uh, to, to go down that route again is nonsensical. Colorless, odorless, undetectable, without any, a device and things of that nature. This is the type of pollution. One little gram does what? Kills you. We, did, we have not developed an immunity to any of this stuff that is whimsical and irresponsible. But anyhow, that's my take. Please come to the meeting of the Chicago Greens, you know, and we'll talk about new things. Uh, let's put an action element into this. But thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, I don't know what happened to our speaker. He did put a lot of time and effort, and I talked. He sent me his thing on Thursday, so I don't know what happened. Yeah, no, we worry. Yeah, we yeah. I get, and I, I check, I check emails. You may not realize I check emails like before I come, but, but I've been home all day, so I didn't hear from him. And, no, you know. I was trying to pick him up, and I couldn't find where he. Oh, was. so something did happen. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. First, I want to ask a gentleman here a question, a, a specific question about the timeline of this stuff. Assuming a Manhattan Project scale orgy, so to speak, of building these things, assuming from the time from now, and we start to work the bugs out, up until the time when we've got a thorium nation, how long do you think that would take? Any ballpark? That's, uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's a question that's actually been okay, been pursued. It takes uh, if you built uh, one reactor a day, 200 megawatt reactor, you could uh, replace the entire baseload energy of the United States in 25 years. Okay, thanks. All right. In my judgment, that's roughly 20 years too damn long, um, and that's being conservative. Until Doug and Ernie mentioned cost, nobody said jack that I heard tonight, unless I was spacing out about cost. And that makes all the difference in the world. Because this place is more or less broke. It is, its brokenness is being hidden by such thing as cooking with books. And it's also being hidden by um, such by creative journalism and redefining things. Wherever Chuck is, Chuck referred to how they, the, the, these guys, they'd have these temps come into these plants, but since the definitions of death from 
n nuclear work didn't include those guys. They just defined the deaths out. But, you know, that's uh, that's how things go in this country. Things get defined ever so conveniently. Yep. So you know, uh, the joint is broke, and my guess is if this if this thing if you get a Manhattan Project type thing here, what's going to happen is maybe we'll get five in, five years into it one way or the other, and the money will run out. And you'll have these 20% or so built monstrosities that will sit there forever that never did anything. It's probably the way it's going to go. And maybe you'll, maybe they can actually build one a year, who knows. That assumes all the bugs are out, and we've heard, a whole, heard, a whole, heard all sorts of references tonight from, from Mr. Meyer and, and, and implicitly from Doug and so on, that the bugs aren't anywhere near out. So my guess is that you'll end up, what you'll end up with is some of these things maybe will actually be built. Who knows whether they'll, any of them will work. But in any case, nowhere near enough to matter, and eventually the society is going to be facing a choice between building more of them and trying to party on like it's 1999, <laughs> and in the process probably having millions of people starve, or throwing in the towel and sort of uh, holding our nose and, and, and just forgetting the money that we more or less pissed away on this kind of stuff. In all likelihood, look folks, you, you, between the cooking of the books and the redefining of inconvenient things, the relationship of this society to truth, especially the elites in this society to truth, is all but non-existent. And under those circumstances, the last thing I would urge or support would be a Manhattan Project in anything. The generation that did the Manhattan Project got the job done, by the way, in three and a half years. There was a sense of, na sense of natural, national urgency. You had the George Bushes and the Jack Kennedys and whatnot, and the Bob Doles risking their asses personally, and Joe Kennedy ended up going down the drain on account of it, Joe Jr. Nowadays, that's not how it works at all. It's somebody else's son, or in some cases, daughter who pays heavy prices. The elites don't lose jack in, these, in, the, in any of these shebangs. The elites cover their ass and sweep turds under rugs in all sorts of various ways. And so what I advise everybody to do is to be ready to fend for yourself and your loved ones, because these bastard elites in this country ain't going to do nothing for you. <laughs> Uh, or you can put through glass steel in the uh, Welcome back. What I wanted to hear tonight was the case against thorium. And I you didn't really hear too much of a case for or against it. And I didn't want to hear a case against it because I got something against it. It's more of a devil's advocate kind of a proposition. Yeah, you know, I just like to know if there's something wrong with it. Now, uh, I think there is a big energy problem. Uh, what I what I don't I think is is I guess some of the cases against Storm that came out in the rebuttals is this business about fluoride, and uh, fluoride is a very Nasty, very reactive element, although it doesn't propose any radiation problems. But there is a fluoridation problem. Like, uh, charges against fluoridation of the water is that it's made from basically nuclear waste. Yeah, yeah, years ago. But anyway, uh, I think there are things that could be done with with uh, fluoridation. If it, if it, and, uh, like we talked about here last uh, year when our, our speaker was here, uh, I talked about steam locomotives, running steam locomotives with thorium, and he said you can't make them that small, make the the, the thorium plant that small. I don't know why, I don't know if I need to know why, but uh, one thing that uh, 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 one thing that thorium 
could do for steam locomotives is desalinization. Because, you know, the next war is the saying going around a few years ago that uh, the next wars are not going to be over oil, they're going to be over water. And, you know, steam locomotives do need to use water. But, uh, uh, your time is up. You've you, 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 you got four minutes, okay? All right. Yes. One more rebut and then we got to get to the speakers. Make it short, just um, uh, since I don't have any figures and I don't use a smartphone, I can check on the figures. But uh, just a commentary about the comments. Um, I kind of am convinced by Neil's conclusion, really, uh, Neil's conclusion that uh, we are about a mix and not about either or. Um, and uh, I regret the uh, discarding other countries that uh, deal with energy a little better than us as suckers. Um, those two factors that Ernie mentioned that have to do with efficiency, which is population and production, right? Those, those are the ones that you identified, Ernie? Okay, uh, population and production. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, Germany, by far, by far, exceeds us uh, reaching those goals. Uh, their efficiency is just unbelievable. I come. I just came back from there. I, I I'm I'm there uh, a lot, and I watch their lifestyle. We were the whole time this summer, this week, that everybody had a sauna, no air conditioners, and no fans even. Uh, but they are used to it. Consumerism is very, very limited. They use, they don't throw away things uh, very fast. They fix them. Uh, they recycle them. They move them. And so uh, the production, the consumption, and the population has historically been low. Um, we can learn from them something. And the plastic shit that uh, Frank is, is claiming his territory is limited, much limited. Um, there, there are many, many examples, both consumerism and in production. Um, another point is the fear. Um, we were encouraged to discard our fears as if this is a bad thing, this is evil. Actually, fear is a defensive mechanism. We have fear to defend us against what we don't know and might be dangerous. Okay? A little skepticism would have made me um, feel more comfortable with John's um, approach, but starting with some dogmatic statements about feel as the enemy of the truth and him having the truth is not a good way. I suggest that you probably have much more to offer than to start with this kind of rhetoric. Thank you. Your call, who goes first? Concluding speakers, concluding remarks. Who wants to go first? Yes, sir. Just like a minute or two? Uh, about three, four minutes. Yeah, I'll just make it quick. So I, I just want to help some of the folks out there know about the molten salt technology. If you don't have time to hang out, I'll hang out and go into boring detail about it. But some of the critiques you have are a little bit out of date. Most of the designs do not have carbon in them, or if they do, they use it in a way where the swelling of the carbon 
is not the issue. Uh, corrosion, uh, corrosion has never been a problem, even in the original. I know where that where that came from was somebody basically went and said, "Hey, if you have salt going through stainless steel, what do you think some of the problems would be?" And they said, "Well, you know, maybe hard to pump, maybe corrosion, maybe," <laughs> and they just just stuck. But when they actually studied the corrosion on the Hastelloy, no corrosion. Now, I'll give you a little secret here, just between you, me, and the lamppost. The, probably the, the things you do want to, you know, if you feel like making a career of critiquing molten salt reactors, uh, two engineering problems we do have are reaction gases and uh, noble metals plating out. We talked a little bit about that, so there you go. I gave you, I gave you all the ammo. I handed you a gun to, you know, duel me with. But they're eminently solvable problems. They're problems that we've solved in other chemical reactions. Uh, one of the other things that somebody brought up was that the U.S. does not need rare earths. Well, tell tell industry <laughs> that they don't need rare earths. We are desperate for rare earths. Uh, and so uh, I, I think uh, that uh, absolutely had to be uh, countered. Uh, one of the things that you know I was talking about for fear is that you know it's it's more and maybe this is a loaded word, but it's more the hypocrisy of fear or, or you know where the double standard. You know we put all sorts of incredibly dangerous things into our homes. You know we we put chlorine and ammonia underneath our sinks. You know we keep you know out of date medicines in our cabinets. You know, we, we leave outlets open and we cook with natural gas. I mean, there's a lot of dangers that we just, because they make our lives better, we look past them or we've learned to, you know, deal with them appropriately. I mean, just imagine how insanely dangerous it is to fill up your car with gasoline. You know, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. So <clears throat> when you, you know, when you think about the, the levels of risk with any energy source, we need to put it in context with the levels of risk of just living in a modern society. And so, <clears throat> uh, one last thing that I would suggest, you know, is you stop thinking of renewables as a way to like power your house or recharge your cell phone or your car, you know, <clears throat> in terms of how renewables fit in the energy mix. That's great. And like I said, I run my little farm out in Iowa on renewable energy. And, you know, by the second day, like I said, I'm consistently disappointed by the, the quality of the energy I have for the investment I made in it. And uh, you have to understand that uh, just electric energy, and I'm not talking about thermal energy, just electric energy, you know, houses aren't, aren't much of an energy use. And, and what we need to do is think about base load energy. That's what keeps the street lights on and the aluminum foundry going and machine tools running and server farms running. And that is not something that's going to be served by windmills or solar cells powering batteries. Little fact, every single battery in the world could only provide 10 minutes of baseload energy for the United States. So remember, I worked at National Renewable Energy Lab. Nobody at the National Renewable Energy Lab, people whose careers were invested in this, thought that renewables would play any sort of significant part in our energy budget. Even Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute says in his TED talk that the majority of new so-called clean power is going to be backed up by natural gas. I am arguing here that we can bypass that and we can just, we can, we can go with efficiencies if you have a strong desire to stay off the grid like I did at my farm, fine, go with solar and wind, but we need to choose the densest, safest, cheapest energy source in the world and that is molten salt reactors fueled with thorium. And I really appreciate your time, and I really appreciate that uh, my partner here uh, picked up the ball, and uh, that, that's fantastic. And thank you so much for the night. Well, uh, tonight we got a, a good presentation, I think, if the audience was paying attention on what a basic learning curve looks like uh, is different people in the audience are at different levels of awareness 
of what's happening. The people that worked with uh, nuclear power or radiation, the people that actually have experience with it, are much more knowledgeable than the people that have never studied it, uh, didn't read much. Uh, a lot of Americans don't like to read a lot of books every week, so it's it's understandable that you know the audience is not really up on uh, the research done by John Goffman or Helen Caldicott. A uh, couple of points, really quick. I was thinking as I'm listening to all the comments, what what major facts points can we agree on that all scientists, virtually all scientists in the world, basically uh, impartially agree on? One, we agree in engineering uh, theory and practice, if you build machines, as you go up in complexity, if more things have to work perfectly every time to turn a motor on or something or whatever it is, as you go up in complexity, if you have three parts, of, like in a furnace, if you have three parts that have to happen and then the heat comes on, that's one thing. And if each one of those parts has a failure rate of one in a million cycles, that's pretty good. Now, if you have a more complex furnace that goes through 12 uh, steps uh, with sensors and everything, and then the heat comes on your house, if each one of those parts is the same safety uh, reliability, one in a million, well, you have four times more service calls, four times more breakdowns on the more complex issue. Uh, as you go up in number of parts and complexity of a whole machine, your problems and service problems go up exponentially. That's a basic, well-accepted fact of engineering. Number two, <clears throat> the only people that do not think we have a global warming problem are people that are paid like from the Tobacco Institute to create doubt, uh, the university professors that are paid a whole bunch of money to produce a report saying there's no such thing as global warming or actually cooling. We have a global warming problem and 987 climate scientists have signed on to a petition saying if we don't get our act together with some kind of Manhattan project to reduce the total fossil fuel burning, if we don't have that project in place and underway, well underway by 2015, 2016, then it's over. Manhattan is going to be underwater, 10, 15 feet of water, in our you know, our children's lifetime, 40, 50 years. That, uh, we do not have time, 20 years, to mess around with developing a solution to the problem we have right now. Third, it's commonly known and accepted by radiation experts, everybody that works with um, x-rays, technicians, uh, hospitals, uh, there's a reason that they wear radiation shields and things when they're working with x-rays and stuff. One, it, it's known, it's well documented, and reported in a bunch of books 30 years ago, one millionth of a gram or less of plutonium will cause lung cancer if it's, that particle is lodged in the lungs. A millionth of a gram. Thorium, not uh, plutonium. No, no. I'm hey, not one full at a time. I'm talking about plutonium because plutonium is going to be produced in these uh, either produced, burned, whatever, we're going to have plutonium and uranium mixed in with the thorium cycle. So you're going to have all kinds of radioactive particles in this new generation of reactors and the whole fuel cycle that have to be safeguarded. You can't let them out on the environment. Also, scientists, it's been reported all over the world, there's no debate on this. Japanese school children now are being given radiation monitors to carry with them 24-7. You have a whole generation of kids growing up with their own personal radiation monitors. That's how bad it is over there. The radioactive level in areas of Tokyo is 20 times bigger than it used to be before Fukushima. Number five, the educational event known as Fukushima is educating the world on what a nuclear disaster looks like, a disaster of biblical proportions. This is not being reported in the United States. The disaster in Japan, the, the, I mean, the, the, sure, there's been a couple articles here and there, but the magnitude of the disaster, how bad it is, 
how the, the infant mortality went up in the west coast as the cloud drifted out of Fukushima and, and headed towards Seattle. These things are already documented. Now I see you know, some people in their head. Uh, we have people in an audience like this will just shake their head and say, oh, well, that's, that's not true. That can't be happening. That's the problem you have with uh, a certain segment of the population will just ignore reality. The final point I'm going to make Naomi Klein, uh, for those of you that are not aware, a lot of you are, she published a book called The Shock Doctrine. And that, that means when, when a country is in a state of shock or there appears to be a big problem, it's seen as an opening, uh, opening for billionaire predators to swoop in and reclaim land, uh, do whatever, uh, you know, get huge welfare from the taxpayers for promoting some kind of a solution. Uh, even if everything John says about thorium reactors are absolutely true, clean, safe, almost too cheap to meter, by the time we get start getting kilowatts out of the thorium cycle in any amount that would make any difference, it'll be 20 years too late to do anything about the global warming problem. That's the, the time frame we have to work with. Promoting thorium is like talking about developing a blood clotting agent uh, in your research lab and it'll be ready in two years to give to an emergency room doctor who has got a patient with a big cut that's bleeding to death right now. You have to stitch up the wound and stop the bleeding. You know, it'd be nice to have a clotting agent on down the line, but uh, how many people are going to be die in the process? This is, you know, uh, we have a tremendous global warming problem that has to be solved now and don't be fooled by all the industry-driven propaganda is the best way to call it, saying that um, there were, 20 years ago we were inundated with quality reports coming out of the industry saying that they don't have to have an evacuation more than two miles of radius around Baltimore, Calvert Cliffs. The wind doesn't blow in Baltimore anymore, and any kind of meltdown it won't blow it off the site more than two miles. They wanted to get a, another offer. You know, Long Island had a nuclear power plant that was shut down. Yeah, because they said, well, uh, Long Island's not an island, so we we have no problem with evacuation. You know, the, the, that that was three candidates for the Golden Shovel Award for the year, named after T. K. Jones. That said, as long as everybody has his own shovel, there's no problem with nuclear war. People can dig their own foxhole. Those three. Commonwealth Edison was promoting nuclear power 25 years ago with exactly the same saying. The sun doesn't shine in Chicago, so we can't use solar here. When it's, uh, take a look. Sun doesn't shine in Chicago, the wind doesn't blow in Baltimore, and Long Island's not an island. This is the kind of stuff we get out of the billionaire funded campaigns to give us nuclear power and big projects. So don't be fooled. I've got a whole list of uh, different flyers with. Um, uh, what do you call it, references I brought tonight for handouts. If anybody wants one, see me over there uh, as, as they're cleaning up, okay? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Make sure you tell them where to go to church tomorrow. Right. Right? You guys are all...